Hi, hello everyone. Thank you for joining World Apakia course. This course has a wonderful lectures from all over the world. Surprisingly, over 2,000 of legislation, there, there are 2,000, over 2,000 legislation for this course. So please, please enjoy this course. Thank you. Hello guys, a uh, pleasure for us to be here with these amazing uh, speakers from around the world. Uh, I believe you will, I believe, I'm sure you will uh, enjoy it. And let's go to Ashwin. Ashwin, you the guy that speak better. No. Uh, so, uh, guys, every once in a while, you know, there comes an event that uh, at least we believe that just makes sense. Uh, this probably is one such event. Uh, it's been curated with some of the best in the world with the aim that covers a blanket over a topic that has eluded many of us. Honestly speaking, it's eluded. And I think probably it still eludes a lot of us in many ways. Uh, Efekia. Uh, so here we present to you the World Efekia course that hopefully puts things to perspective and gives you all a flavor of what's really all around the world that people are doing currently practicing in their practices and that works at least in their hand and many more. So some of the ground rules for this webinar and this course is we love to get questions and we love to answer those questions. They may not be wildly wise questions, but they may and might be very simple questions, yet a question like a phone call needs to be answered. So just guys, uh, put in your questions on the website. You can see our course on worldwcrs.com or on the YouTube channels of Dr. Sergio Canabrava or Dr. Agarwal's clinical education. Any one of these, go ahead, click on and view. You can also share those wherever you need to. Without wasting any more of your time or the faculty's time, I wanted to also take this opportunity to introduce to you our first course uh, our first session, Basics in Anterior Vitrectomy. And to do the moderation for this course, I couldn't find or think of better names than Namrata Sharma, Naveen Rao, and a special panelist, George Baiko. So I'm handing off to them by starting off this one video. Uh, so can we have the video, please? Thank you, Ashvin. It's my pleasure to co-moderate this course with Dr. Namrata Sharma, and I've been looking forward to this for several months now. I think it'll be a wonderful uh, session and a uh, wonderful day. I wanted to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Rohit Om Prakash from the Om Prakash Eye Institute in Amritsar, India, and he'll be discussing signs of posterior capsule rupture. So let's begin our first talk. Thank you, Naveen. Dr. Naveen, I would be talking about uh, signs of posterior capsule rupture. Is my screen visible and am I audible? Yeah. I would like to uh, thank Ashwin for organizing such a beautiful uh, course. So I would be speaking about signs of posterior capsule rupture. So these signs of posterior capsule rupture, uh, the first thing which we have to realize is that the biggest complication which we dread in a cataract surgery is a posterior capsule rupture. The classical signs of posterior capsule rupture include sudden deepening of the anterior chamber when suddenly when you're doing phaco emulsification, you find that the chamber has deepened and pupillary snap sign. Suddenly you find that there is a sudden jerky uh, pupillary constriction uh, during hydrodissection. And there's a transient, transitory increased red glow more so in the periphery. And when you are doing FACO, you realize there is a decreased followability, inability to rotate, sculpt, and bury the FACO uh, needle. And at the same time, there's a nuclear tilt. So posterior capsule rupture can occur when the bag is intact or when there can be a zonulopathy. 
If there's a zonulopathy, we'll be talking about it shortly. Posterior capsule rupture with an intact capsular bag can be because in the presence of maybe an intact capsular excess, wherein we can use a sulcus fixated IOL and that clinches the issue. But whenever there is an anterior capsular tear, then this whole webinar is all about anterior capsular tear and zonulopathy and the posterior capsule rupture associated with it. So this anterior capsular tear can occur in primarily every uh, surgeon's hand. So we are at a crossroad of surgical dilemma, whether to continue with the plan A of converting to extra capsular surgery or to continue with phacoemulsification. So the next thing is because in these cases, what happens is the phacoemulsification can be continued uh, successfully without any problem. But there are times when we end up with a nucleus drop. So these are the main glitches which we come across. So what is the answer to this surgical dilemma? The answer lies in either we know about, we should know about the flap motility sign and we go on with the safe surgical techniques. Well, what is this flap motility sign? This is the sign for posterior capsule rupture in peripherally extended anterior capsular tears. What is the concept of flap motility sign? Well, the concept is if the flap is averted and fluttering, it is pre equatorial by all means. And if by any chance it extends on to the posterior capsule, then it becomes flat and it becomes inverted. So this is the basic concept of flap motility sign. So what is there is if the flap, as you can see in an anterior capsular tear, the moment you introduce the visco, the flap, this flap has become averted and it has started fluttering the moment you introduce the fluidics. So once you see that the flap is averted and fluttering, this is conclusive of the fact that it is pre-equatorial and you can continue with safe for surgical FACO techniques and without any uh, problem of your facing the situation of a posterior capsule rupture, you will find that even when you know the, you are doing IA, this flap is averted and it is fluttering. And even when you implant an intraocular lens, the flap is averted and fluttering. So my dear friends, when you find it is averted and fluttering, you can continue and put an intraocular lens in the bag without any risk whatsoever. So in this case, I would like to show that the fellow resident who was trying to enlarge the rexis ended up in a situation where the rexis extended onto the periphery. So when it extended onto the periphery, he continued with phacoemulsification. And the moment he divided, you will find now at this point of time, the flap has stopped fluttering and it has become flat. So this shows that it has extended beyond and the uh, fellow oblivious of the relevance of flap motility sign continued and there was a nucleus drop which happened uh, as it would have in this situation. So with this application of flap motility sign, we come to know of the end point of safe phacoemulsification. That is the point when you can avoid the dreadful complications of posterior capsule rupture the moment it stops fluttering. The relevance of this flap motility sign is that it helps us, sorry, it helps us, uh, it helps us to implant the intraocular lens in the bag. So if the, fla the flaps are inverted, this means now you have to do other things and, do, and this is what the whole uh, course is going to be all about. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Rohit. Uh, excellent talk. I, I think that I've personally found that very useful when we have an anterior tear. George, um, do you find this uh, to be uh, helpful uh, for not just anterior capsule tears, but uh, what kind of signs would you look for if there was, let's say, an equatorial capsule tear to know if there's vitreous or if you can stop vacoing or continue? You may have to unmute. Sorry about that. Um, you're asking about an equatorial tear? Right. Sometimes we have an equatorial tear, but sometimes it's an anterior capsular tear. How would you know, uh, you know if you need to stop phacoing or continue phacoing if you have a situation where there's a, a tear either in the edge of the rexus or just beyond the edge of the rexus? You know, I, I think the bro hits video and bro hit sign is very important for us. I mean, I, I think this is a, 
uh, a good thing for beginning surgeons to realize that this sign is helpful. Um, and I find that whenever I have an anterior capsular tear and I'm worried that it, it has extended beyond the equator, I, I stop doing the phaco within the bag. I will try and bring the pieces out into the anterior chamber and, and isolate them with viscoelastic. If I'm really worried about a huge tear, I'll do the um, scaffold technique in which I'll bring in the IOL and place it underneath the pieces and then do, the, you know, um, phaco emulsify the pieces in the anterior chamber and, and examine the capsule afterwards. So I think the important thing is to try and prevent those pieces from falling back into the vitreous cavity. Thank you. Dr. Namartha, would you like to introduce our yeah. next speaker? So it is, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Shin, Ashwin, and uh, Sergio for uh, this <clears> wonderful <throat> course. And it is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker uh, with whom I have done a couple of uh, courses on keratoplasty. Dr. Yuri McKee from East Valley Ophthalmology, Mesa, Arizona, USA. And he's going to be talking to us about anterior vitrectomy and anterior and posterior maintainers. Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, early morning from Phoenix and Merry Christmas to all. Uh, and thank you so much for having me. Just a, a great talk to, to start the session. That, that's an excellent uh, anterior flap sign there. Uh, so I have the distinct pleasure of talking about everyone's least favorite uh, topic, which is having to do the vitrectomy, but it's very important to master uh, vitrectomy. I don't have any uh, financial disclosure uh, for this topic. Uh, and here's some of my most important points. First of all, do not operate from a position of fear. Operate from a position of confidence. Know that you know the right techniques and know that you can handle this problem. This is going to make your mental mindset much more successful when you have vitreous present. So master the vitreous, do not fear it. So there's a couple of key points here that I want to talk about when you're doing either a pars plane vitrectomy or either an anterior vitrectomy. And that is number one, do not allow hypotony. This will just cause more and more vitreous to keep coming forward. You have to put an infusion, you have to tampon on things with viscoelastic as indicated. The first thing you should do when vitreous presents is to manage it. Do not ignore it, do not be oblivious to it, do not wish it away. Simply stop what you're doing and get it away from you and away from different fragments or instruments because the peripheral vitreous is hanging onto the peripheral retina, which is 10 times weaker than the central retina, and it's going to tear if you mess with it without removing it through a safe and effective vitrectomy. Stabilize the lens pieces, as George just discussed. Remove the cataract, supercapsular if needed, and then execute your plan for IOL support. And then finally, there may be iris problems in these cases, and that's what you're going to fix last. So let me start my video here. And you can see in this case, you're looking at a IOL that is dislocated and you're looking at the edge of the IOL. So it is, it is fallen 90 degrees and it's floating in the vitreous. The very first thing I have to do is do a vitrectomy. So here I'm doing a pars plana vitrectomy. I have infusion set through the pars plana. I'm using my light pipe to illuminate vitreous and a high speed cutter. And this is a very fast and efficient way. Once all the vitreous is gone, I can reach in with a 25 gauge forceps and lucky us, this is a three piece IOL. So I can simply bring it straight in to the sulcus and then do a glued IOL. Let's look at the infusion. That's what I'm gonna talk about today. Did you see how I came at an angle and then rotated through with the pars plana? Now I have a free hand. I don't have to hold an infusion. So my light pipe is in one hand and the extrusion cannula is in the other. After I complete the vitrectomy, the extrusion cannula with a soft silicone tip can be used to occlude the suction on this IOL and that will be enough force to pick the IOL right off the macula, bring it right up to the sulcus into the anterior chamber, cut it in half, and then remove it in halves. And I could not do this procedure without that infusion in there to keep the eye inflated. So again, you come in at an angle through the pars plana and then push straight in. And then you can remove your trocar. But if you don't go all the way in, you'll be in the supraciliary space. And if you infuse here without uh, first checking the position of that cannula, you can have a serious complication. So perhaps you're more comfortable using an anterior chamber maintainer. Certainly acceptable. This is a video from Ashwin, and they're showing how they're removing this dislocated lens. But the problem with an anterior chamber maintainer is it requires a bigger incision through the limbus. And when you pull it out, the chamber can collapse 
or it can leak. You can see air leaking from around this anterior chamber maintainer, and then you have to put a stitch in there. And so there must have been a better way to do this if through the anterior segment. And here you can see a few years ago now, I'm making an incision with my paracentesis blade, just a very small one, and I'm gonna take a posterior chamber trocar but look at how big the blade is and how long the trocar is. I could hit the iris or other structures. That's not that safe. So uh, Dr. Agarwal came up with the trocar AC maintainer, uh, and it's all nicely packaged from Mastel. I have no financial interest. It comes with the infusion cannula, but it's shorter and designed to go at a 45 degree angle from the limbus and then introduce this specially designed trocar AC maintainer for the anterior chamber. And then you can plug in uh, your infusion line, and this is excellent because now you have infusion anteriorly, and if you do uh, uh, vitrectomy posteriorly, it will pull vitreous strands backward, and they disappear like magic. So here's uh, uh, Dr. Agarwal doing this, uh, 45 degrees from the limbus, and then advancing this trocar in, and we're ready for infusion to keep our eye inflated, as you see is doing a glued IOL there. So very, very important to keep infusion in the eye. And I'm just showing you a couple of different ways to do that for glued IOL, uh, for other things. And when you pull it out, it should be self-sealing at the limbus there. Uh, and so here's a case of mine where you can see I've already done my scleral flaps and marked uh, the horizontal meridian. And now I'm inserting the AC maintainer, the trocar AC maintainer. And now this case, there's already been a vitrectomy done. So I can just reach down and pick up this one piece PMMA lens, a large PMMA lens that normally require a large incision to remove. Why well, do that? Simply inflate the eye and then do the handshake maneuver through a sclerotomy. And you can do a glued IOL with these one piece PMMA lenses, which last forever. They're fantastic lenses. And this patient had everything done through his dislocated lens, through a paracentesis and two sclerotomies. And he was very happy and the surgery went very quick and smooth. So. Uh, those are just a few tricks with using the infusion, which is the most important point when you're going to do the vitrectomy is keep that eye inflated uh, and prevent the hypotony. Now, I like to make all scleral incisions before I enter the eye with flaps and tunnels. I place my uh, vitrectomy ports as the first entry into the eye so that I can get the infusion going right away and keep the eye firm. Uh, I manage vitreous as soon as I see it. You can, of course, put uh, <clears throat> triamcinolone to better visualize vit vitreous. Uh, always inspect your peripheral retina after vitrectomy to make sure you don't have a hole or tear that requires laser or uh, tamponade. And it's always uh, a good idea to leave a little air in the posterior segment to tamponade these sclerotomy wounds. Uh, when you're using the vitrector, you can eat iris as fast as vitreous. So avoid the iris and keep the port away from it. Uh, don't tug on, on vitreous. Just leave your, your probe in one place until all the vitreous in that area has been eaten up and then move to a different place. But don't move the vitrector while it's engaging vitreous. You could tear the peripheral retina. Uh, but don't ignore those holes or tears or pretend like they might not exist. Always go looking for them. You don't have to induce a PVD. You shouldn't mess with anything outside your specialty, like peeling retinal membranes or anything. Just get the vitreous disentangled. And once again, do not allow hypotony. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so yes, I was I was talking about the technique I prefer to to fix the eye fake. So I always like to associate uh, the posterior parsplanar vitrectomy uh, to correct all my eye fake eye fake patients. Uh, so in this particular case, I open a wound at 5.5 millimeters uh, posteriorly and place the trocar um, on the parsplanar. As you see here, after completely vitrectomy, I lift uh, the three pieces in charcoal lens and I grasp it with a special forceps uh, in order to remove that. And I use a carbacol to close the pupil. And once that's done, I position in the, the claw lens uh, in the right positioning and with specific in the special forceps, I grasp the lens and clamp in the posterior to the iris, which I think is the best positioning. I have to remember that the intraocular lens calculation, the correct power of calculation is, is different if you put anterior or posterior. So that's something you have to pay attention on. It. And once that's clipped on the iris, you just leave it and the iris usually is like that in the end of the procedure. Uh, 
uh, you may suture uh, one one ten oh nine is enough, and I always uh, remove the posterior uh, viscoelastic to avoid glaucoma. And I like to use T cell glue to reduce the risk of hypotony in those cases. We don't have to do that. Um, and this is a different case. I, I this patient has a multifocal intraocular lens, and I remove it. As you see here, uh, the same technique I I did uh, the, for the first time. Um, once you get used with this technique, I think uh, that's the best way to correct uh, the, those 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 pro those problems. As you see here in this particular case, I didn't use the special forceps uh, to hold the lines, which I think it's it's I, I, I would recommend for every case. In this particular case, I did a different technique. I I did after a corneal uh, wound, I did a anterior uh, vitrectomy. And I realized there was a uh, intra intracapsular ring in, uh, fixated with uh, tenon nylon uh, in the eye. So I have to remove this this ring um, from the uh, at the interior from the interior chamber, and I did a full vitrectomy. And once that's done, the eye doesn't look good. So I decided to to use um, uh, Gore-Tex to suture uh, the acre lens in a parse plano. I think it is my second favorite technique to to fix those problems. And once that's done, uh, the, uh, so I decide to do uh, uh, suture suture the iris just to, to like do I look better. And I also like to use uh, endoscopy to check uh, the sclerotomy, to check the positioning of the intercrawl lens, to check if the suture is well positioned. Sometimes I find uh, bands of vitreous or bands of rest of tissue that has to be removed to avoid uh, intercrawl lens malpositioning. In the end, I also use the T-cell glue. In this patient, uh, this this patient had a, had a retinal detachment. He had operation uh, uh, before. As you see here, the retina was completely detached. So I I, I did a 180 degrees retinotomy and I removed the anterior capsule uh, that was inside the eye. And with the same technique, I decided to fixate the acres lens with a cortex suture, as you see here. Uh, and I think that's very important in this particular case because uh, I, I, pl I placed a, a silicone oil at the end of the, of the procedure, and it's very important to, to keep the silicone oil in the posterior chamber. Uh, if you don't put the intraocular lens, the silicone oil will migrate to the cornea and you touch and the torch in the tedium and you'll damage. Uh, and after the positioning of the intraocular lens, so I decided to close the iris, and and with, uh, with the instruments, I did a laser air fluid exchange and placed the silicone oil inside the eye. Uh, there's a last case, and the, this patient was operated by one of my fellows. This patient had a recurrent vitreous hemorrhage associated with glaucoma and uveitis. So we did a UBM before, and the patient had uh, these three pieces in intraocular lens that was touching the socals and causing the ear iritis. So with uh, endoscopy, it was possible to check where the intraocular lens was and the socals touching the, the ciliary body. And I, we think that we may be the cause of the, the recurrent uh, hyphema and the recurrent glaucoma. So as you see here, uh, it's very nice to have an endoscopy associated with the posterior vitrectomy because you can check uh, the positioning of the lenses and the anterior chamber and the, and the, the, the capsule. Um, so that will help us to decide uh, for the best of our patients. Once that's done, I we remove the lens and remove all the capsule bag and we check the posteriorly. And also it's possible to, to do a kind of gonioscopy and also very interesting because sometimes if you, you see a hemorrhage or you see silicone oil uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the angle. As you see here, the ciliary body was there, there was no problems. So remove all the, the remaining vitreous and all remaining cortex. And after that, we did a high stent implantation because the patient had glaucoma, everything in one single procedure. And 
the patient was left actually a fake because um, this patient has he was high, highly myopic patients and the intraocular lens the calculation was to zero so we decided to leave it in a fake so not every phase patients we put on intraocular lens but I'd like to present this case just because of the endoscopy was very interesting and and, uh, and make us to think about that. So I think you should consider pars plana vitrectomy in all the cases that you 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 consider correcting the aphaca. I think you will have less problems. Even for anterior segment surgeon, I do consider uh, train those the surgeons to be more comfortable in a posterior uh, posterior part of the eye. Thank you for the kind of invitation. Thank you, Dr. Andre Amaya, for that uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, now we have the next presentation from Dr. Brandon Ayers from Wills Eye Hospital, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, from USA. And the presentation is on sutures and ring segments. Welcome to World Aphakia. My topic is sutures and segments. This is my financial disclosure. Nothing will impact the subject matter of today's talk. The course description is basically going to be video based showing complex cases. Almost everything you're going to see is going to be off label. And our goal is to get through five techniques in the next five minutes. You're going to need some extra materials during these cases, a multiple selection of, of sutures, as well as intraocular forceps and a vitrector. I want to first talk about trying to save the capsular bag. And whenever you're dealing with the zonulopathy, there's two basic rules. Stabilize the capsular bag and properly deal with vitreous. In the case you're watching, we're at the end of a traumatic cataract removal. The cataract's already been removed and we did use a capsular support hook or two to get this cataract out. The IOL and a capsular bag is now in, uh, sorry, the IOL and a capsular tenturing is now in the capsular bag. We've already performed a parse plane of based anterior vitrectomy. A AMED segment, uh, about a third of a capsular tenturing with a suturable eyelid is now being laced with Gore-Tex suture. The Gore-Tex suture is externalized through sclerotomies approximately two millimeters posterior to the limbus. The CTR is then placed, or the CTS is then placed in the capsular bag, and the suture is used almost like artificial zonules to center the lens. Depending on the level of zonulopathy or degree of zonulopathy, you may need one, two, or even three of these segments to properly center the lens. Now, what if you don't have a capsular bag at all? There are a variety of ways that we can suture an IOL. One of the simplest techniques is iris fixation. This is a great technique when you want to be minimally invasive, it simply requires a three-piece IOL, leaving the optic anterior to the iris and capturing the haptics posterior to the iris. Using a tenopolypropylene suture on a, I like to use the CIF4 needle, the needle is drawn through the iris under the haptic and back out through the iris again. This will capture the optic, sorry, the iris and the haptic. The knot can be tied using a variety of techniques. In this case, we're using a McAnal suture. Once both sutures are tied and the knot's cut, you can then carefully prolapse, and I do stress prolapse the optic through the iris, putting it back in the posterior chamber. And then simply tugging on the pupil border can allow a, a little bit more of a rounding, if you will, of the pupil border to stop some of the peaking that we often see in the iris suture technique. Now, what about suture fixation? Well, the key to success with any uh, scleral fixated IOL with suture is measurement, 180 degrees across the visual axis. I like to go about three millimeters posterior to the limbus and put my sclerotomies approximately four millimeters apart. Any small incision sutured IOL is going to require careful balancing of the suture and then burying the knot into the sclerotomy. Here we are midway through our technique. This is a dislocated IOL in the capsular bag. The IOL capsular bag sum ring ring is going to be removed and a vitrectomy performed. We're using the Balchalam AO60 implant, a hydrophilic acrylic IOL. The Gore-Tex suture is laced through the haptics on both sides, creating mattress sutures. The IOL is then placed in the posterior segment, and the suture is carefully balanced, and then the knot's buried for placement of the IOL. The technique works beautifully, but opacification of the hydrophilic acrylic material has been described, especially when exposed to air, gas, and silicone oil. So the technique works, but the material is the Achilles heel. So can another implant like the MX60 be used using a similar technique? And the answer is yes. There are some reports of the MX60 breaking. Again, this is off-label. But here we're suturing using the same suture technique, the Balchalam MX60 Toric. So the advantage of this is not only in the hydrophil uh, hydrophobic acrylic material, but also that we can manage uh, astigmatism using a sutured IOL technique. At the end of the case, we've got beautiful alignment of our IOL in the steep axis. 
Now, the recent rage has been intrascleral haptic fixation, or the Imani technique, where a three-piece IOL is placed, the haptics externalized, and then cauterized using low-temperature cautery. Measurement is also key. Straight across the visual axis, two and a half to three millimeters posterior to the limbus, and then using an intraspinal channel of about two millimeters. This uses a thin wall 30 gauge needle or 27 gauge needle, depending on your technique. A quick tip to make this easier is in that trailing haptic. Make sure you shift that incision a little bit to the left. That'll help you align that trailing haptic in the thin wall 30 gauge needle. Here we are placing the IOL, our three piece IOL is already in the anterior chamber using an artificial. Uh, sorry, using an anterior chamber maintainer. The haptic is carefully grasped and then placed into the lumen of the thin wall 30 gauge needle. This needs to be done for both haptics prior to externalization. Once the haptics are incarcerated, we can then use low temperature cautery to melt the haptic, preventing prolapse back through the anterior, uh, sorry, back through the scleral wall. So an elegant technique works very nicely, but the Achilles heel is in decentration and tilt with these implants. So let's quickly review. There are multiple techniques available for fixation of an IOL in the absence of capsular support, including trying to save the capsular bag when possible. Suture fixation of a hydrophilic acrylic IOL is effective, but you have to watch out for the material. And that same technique can be modified for either the Imani technique or for Gore-Tex fixation of a hydrophobic acrylic IOL. Thank you for your attention. Great. That was an excellent talk from Brandon Ayers. Um, uh, excellent videos. While we're preparing for the next talk, uh, George, I wondered what your thoughts are about suturing one-piece acrylic lenses to the sclera uh, through these eyelets. Uh, is there any concern for uh, UGG syndrome with uh, chafing from those long haptics sticking off of the one-piece lens? Um, I tend not to suture the one-piece lenses. I, I'd rather take those out and then put in a three-piece lens. I, you know, I think the, the problem is uh, with tilt and decentration, if you're using that one-point fixation, the other thing is you have to leave those sutures a little bit loose in order to, um, you know, to stabilize that lens. And so I'm not happy doing that. Um, uh, you know, I'll take the one-piece lenses out it's easy enough. You just put them in the anterior chamber, cut them, take them out, and you know, put in your favorite three-piece. And and I tend to go to a hydrophobic acrylic uh, three-piece for the reasons that Brandon said. You know, we're worried about uh, opacification of the optic, and hydrophilic lenses are certainly an issue there. And with silicone lenses, we're worried about silicone oil being used. These are complex cases, and you want to make sure that. Uh, you know, any eventuality is dealt with. So a hydrophobic three-piece is uh, my go-to. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Dr. Durval Cavallo at the CBV Hospital de Lojos in Brasilia, Brazil, speaking about instruments needed for scleral fixation. Please. Hello, everybody. It's a great honor for me. It's a great honor for me to be part of this panel and talk to friends around the, all, all around of the world. The, my, my, my lecture about the instruments need for scleral fixation. Uh, in the past, we have just needles and, uh, and the rigid IOL. So here today, we have needles uh, with thin wall, 30 gauge, and micro instruments that give us a great evolution of the, the secondary implant. Uh, my favorite, uh, micro phosphorus it is micro holding phosphorus with uh, have a tooth in the inner surface you can hold the IOL and EPC whatever you want this is a maneuver to to take the EPC in the right position at the sulcus I call under IOL levitation it's uh, you can check is when pull the the suture and the IOL keep keeping don't move. Another micro holding for for is a by chi the subluxating IOL grasping. Uh, it has a round a ring at, at the tip, so you can tight the the IOL and the and the IOL is uh, becomes very stable. It, she used for iris fixation and to clean the fibrosis around the IOL. The micro graspers uh, 
done by Ahmed. It's very nice instruments too. I work on this uh, technique that I call haptocoplasty and uh, with the Yamani technique and the I was uh, decentered. You can twist the the aptki aptki with the two microphospis, one microphospis and one micrograspers. So it can center the IOL after you do the Yamani technique. Uh, there is another variation with haptki micrograspers. Uh, here in the she haptki micrograspers and then Dr. Figueiredo manipulator. I use, it's very uh, interesting too, the IOL cutting scissor, the micro, micro cutting scissor is very, very nice instrument for uh, explant the, the IOL. I did this zigzag explant technique that I call, and when you uh, divide in three, in three thirds, but not complete, so the IOL explanted uh, like a spaghetti, you don't lose any any piece to the posture pole. And for instrument suture instruments developed by Ahmed is very nice because we can tie and uh, and use the needle driver. You can do this intraocular in the inter anterior chamber. It's uh, it's very smooth. It's a very very interest uh, instruments. And for capturing suture, I like very much the the condom snare too. It's uh, you can capture the the suture inside the eye, and and don't lose. Uh, and you can uh, help the, us to to tighten the the suture at the haptic. It's very nice, and I highlight the the she suture retrieving too. It's work very well. The injectors. It does, we have a OTA needle injector. When you use the AB internal uh, technique and I has the outsert injector from Alcon. It's automatic injector. You, you can dismiss your assistance to, 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 to have one free hand. And one system that we help us a lot to understand the the scleral fixation is the endoscopy. This is technique developed, uh, developed and defended by my father, Dr. Carvalho. The, you can, with endoscopy, you can achieve the right position at the sulcus, uh, the perforation. So it, it can uh, help us to, to do the right thing to the scleral fixation. And after you implant the the IOL, you can check it. It's the great advantage of the endoscopy. If, if the, the aptic is in the right position and uh, it is, it is help us a lot to discover the, some cause of dislocating IOL. And now you can check in the, in the right position at the sulcus. It's a very helpful system. And this is a maneuver that we, we mix uh, many, many instruments. I call it three-hand maneuver. It's a, it's a case of the one-piece uh, IOL was tight and subluxating IOL. So I use endoscopy, microphosphorus, and micro scissors in the same eye. So uh, we have to, to cut the, the suture from inside the eye. This is, uh, ju ju this work was possible just to, with the endoscopy. So we have many cases the endoscopy make difference. Uh, this is this instrument by Yamani. A, this is a stabilizer ring Yamani. It's very helpful to, to achieve the right position, right perforation of the needle. And uh, the, the, it will offer you the right angle. And this is a, we are, was talking about the one piece fixation, one piece biofixation. This is a, a new uh, technique that I'm developing. 
This is a modified Canabrava and Yamani techniques and used to the proline 500 is a piercing. You, you pierce the uh, IOL aptic. This is a ray one trifocal, one piece. So you can transfixate the, the aptic and pass the, the proline 500. So in this case, I did two, two sutures in the same haptic, and you can check the, the, the haptic in, by endoscopy. It's, it's not in the, at the sulcus. So this is the, the final piercing. Thank you, uh, my international guest, for our second edition of sec fixation secondary implants. And uh, I invite you to the Brascas to the next year in Salvador. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Durwell, for your wonderful presentation, which covered all the instruments possible. So George, uh, last question for you. If somebody was to have basic instruments which you know which instruments you would say that you know one needs to add to the uh, to your normal cataract surgery set you know if you have to do these kind of procedures i think the graspers the micro graspers are the most important things that you need and you need two of those um i tend to stay away from the tooth graspers because i find that some of the haptics if you grab them with that It'll break off the haptic, so it, it, um, just a, a straight edge on the micro graspers. They're available from a number of different companies. MST obviously is a big company, but they're also available from Epsilon and Aseco and a few others. And uh, a good pair of scissors for cutting the, um, that are able to cut the IOL. So I think those are the three instruments that you should have available to you as a start. So I think uh, Naveen, can we, Dr. Naveen, can we conclude this session? Yes, thank you everyone for that excellent uh, series of talks and videos. We'll go ahead and end this session and move on to the next one, uh, which is session two. So I'll turn it back over to Ashwin, Shin, and Sergio. Thanks, Naveen. Thank you. Let, let's move to the second session. Second session has seven wonderful lectures. This session includes talks about ACIOL, ICE Crow IOL, and Sucha IOLs. Ashraf, please start session two. Uh, hi, Shin. Uh, hi, everyone. And it's a pleasure to, uh, to, to be in this great event worldwide. The next presentation is from uh, Nicole Pram. She'll be covering up the iris sutured IOLs. Can we have her presentation, please? Today on IOL exchange and iris suture fixation pearls. My name is Nicole Fram, and I'd love to share this video with you. Now, this is a patient that had beautiful cataract surgery, has an Acrosoft toric IOL in the bag. The patient has positive and negative dysphotopsia and requires an IOL exchange. Here I'm using the Donenfeld femtosecond spatula for a different purpose. It fits perfectly under the anterior capsule, and then I'm using a dispersive viscoelastic to viscodissect. In addition, as the late Alan Crandall has taught us, you want to go down the optic-haptic junction to try and loosen up the haptic. Now you can see here that we put a lot of viscoelastic in, so we want to burp the viscoelastic out, and instead of ruining the zonule, we're actually going to amputate these haptics because often when we amputate the haptics, we can then get the optic out and then the haptics will come out of the bag more easily. So we're using 23 gauge MST scissors and 23 gauge serrated forceps to hold on to the lens and we're amputating these haptics. Next we use the 23 gauge serrated forceps and we go ahead and cut with 19 gauge scissors and here we can bisect the optic very easily using these micro instruments. Now you want to pull towards you as you're cutting so that you can make sure you're not engaging the anterior capsule. And then we always block when we pull this out of our 2.4 millimeter incision, which we will enlarge to three millimeters to accommodate the three piece IOL we're going to put in. So you could have left these haptics in, but you can try to viscodissect down the cocoon 
that is created around these haptics. Now with the Acrosoft platform, what you see is that you have fibrosis around the terminal bulb. With other platforms, it's at the optic haptic junction. But if you follow the curvature circumferentially, you can get these out. Now here, we were in the wrong position sitting temporally, so we moved. And really, when I'm just pulling, I'm just gonna affect the zonule. So I keep viscodissecting, and the key is to have counter traction. So I'm using the spatula and the 23 gauge forceps, and I'm creating this counter traction so that I'm not pulling on the zonule. And you'll see that that terminal bulb came right out of the cocoon safely, and then we'll take this out. But once again, we could have left these haptics in the bag. Now, for the negative dysphotopsia, we need to move the optic forward and cover the nasal capsule. That will shift the shadow outside of the patient's view. For the positive dysphotopsia, we want to change the IOL material. Now, because this rexus is so big, we can't do an optic capture. So we need to fixate this three-piece lens that's in the sulcus. And what we're gonna do is use iris suture fixation, and this is a mechanical technique. This is a CTC6 needle. Um, it's on Tenno polypropylene, and sometimes it can be tricky to get in through a paracentesis. So we can use a second instrument as a guide. Now the reason why we get an ovalized pupil is because our bites are too big and they're not peripheral enough. We'd like to see that the pupil came down a little bit more when we put in our intracameral um, meiotics, but this will do. Um, the optic is on top of the capsule so that you can see the haptic underneath. Now here what we're doing is we're using bond hooks, but you can use a Kuglin hook and you can use a Condon snare. And we're going in and we're retrieving the um, suture free ends. And we retrieve them to make these loops. They kind of look like bunny ears. Then we figure out which end is free and we retrieve that so that make sure you're not pulling on the end that's connected to the iris. If you pull on the end connected to the iris, you'll be very sad because you have to start over. Next, we do this on the other side. Now, you'll notice we have a bit of heme. Why do we have the heme? Because the paracentesis that I made were too peripheral. And so we want to try to avoid that in the future. And you need to get rid of these clots because you can't see what you're doing. And sometimes when you start tying, the clot will then go on the knot and then you don't get a complete uh, knot. So here we're going to tie in a 2-1-1 fashion and we'll go ahead and just tie this gently because remember we have the whole sulcus supporting the lens. These sutures are just there to make sure that it doesn't move over time. Now here we see that heme. We're going to try and get rid of that before we secure down that knot. And we just continue to tie one side and then the other and then we can go ahead and cut these knots right at the limbus uh, to allow for a uh, nice titration of the suture end. So here we'll just cut that right at the limbus. Next, we want to make sure that we sweep where these knots are so that they're not incorporated in the paracentesis. And then when we reposit the IOL posteriorly, you just push down. You don't want to rotate the haptic out of the knot and then not have a secure fixation. So here we see we have a relatively round pupil. We're sweeping again to make sure everything's okay. And then we're going to remove the viscoelastic using bimanual irrigation and aspiration intracameral moxifloxacin, and then checking that the eye is normotensive and that there's Cydal negative. And so the patient finished up nicely, did really well, the positive and negative dysphotopsia were resolved, and this is a very clear, good explanation of why iris fixation fits into our armamentarium. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was a very great, uh, elegant way in handling uh, the case, really. Um, so uh, our next uh, presentation uh, will be by uh, Richard Hoffman, uh, talking about the Hoffman pocket, which is uh, one of the best, and I like this uh, technique so much. And uh, we are going to hear it from uh, uh, Richard Hoffman. Uh, so please. Greetings, participants of this World Aphakia course. I'm Richard Hoffman. I'm going to talk about secondary IOL implantation using a corneal scleral pocket. The original description of this technique was in these patients who had sublux capsular bag IOL complexes. But the reality is this technique can be used in any instance where you want to fixate any device or an IOL to the sclera. 
It's especially useful for secondary IOLs. The first step is to make two corneal scleral pockets that are 180 degrees apart from each other, and then a double arm suture is passed through the full thickness of the globe uh, corresponding to where these pockets are. The needles are removed, and then the suture ends are externalized by placing a Sinsky hook into the pocket and pulling each end out. The suture ends are then tightened and tied, allowing the knot to slide under the protective roof of the scleral pocket. And what I'm going to do now is just describe the technique of fixating a foldable three-piece lens using a cow hitch knot for fixation. So in this particular patient, uh, two corneal scleral pockets have already be cr been created to the right and to the left, and then this suture is passed through the full thickness of the globe by docking it into a 27 gauge needle. And what we do is we leave a loop of proline suture outside of the eye and then fold it over onto itself to create this cow hitch knot, which is attached to the leading haptic and eventually the trailing haptic of the IOL. What I'm going to show you now is a video of a transplant patient who had some trauma, extruded their IOL, and then needed a secondary uh, IOL. So a corneal skull pocket has already been created to the left, and you'll see one being created to the right a temporal clear corneal incision about 3.2 to 3.5 millimeters uh, in size is then made and then this 27 gauge needle is passed through the full thickness of the globe corresponding to the pocket. A 9 -o double arm proline suture needle is docked into this and pulled out and then the second arm of the 9 -o proline uh, suture is docked into a second 27 gauge needle 2 millimeters posterior to the limbus about a millimeter adjacent to the first pass and again rather than pulling that suture into the eye, the loop of proline is left outside of the eye, folded over onto itself with the aid of a little dollop of viscoelastic. The IOL is uh, treated on the end to create a little nub with low uh, cautery, placed in a cartridge injector with the leading haptic extruded slightly, and then the cowhitch knot is attached to that leading haptic. The haptic is placed in the eye, the cartridge injector is placed in the eye, and then the IOL is injected into the anterior chamber, leaving the trailing haptic outside of the eye. And tension is kept on those proline sutures to keep the knot uh, tied tight. And then once the IOL is in the eye, the same thing is done for the trailing haptic on the other side with this left corneal scleral pocket. And once that suture is attached, uh, the trailing haptic is brought into the eye, the needles are removed uh, from the uh, sutures, and then the ends are retrieved uh, with a Sinsky hook placed into the pocket, externalizing uh, each of the suture ends. These are uh, then tied with a 311 surgeon knot. The knot is trimmed at the, um, at the knot, and this allows the knot to slide under the protective uh, roof of the scleral pocket. And the same thing is done on the other side. There's several things to keep in mind when you're performing this technique, and most importantly, you want to start with the right-hand pocket. So if this is a patient's uh, right eye, the right-hand pocket is located inferiorly. If this was the patient's left eye, that right-hand pocket would be located superiorly. And the reason that you start with the right-hand pocket is that if you started with the left-hand pocket and then you pulled on that proline suture, you could pull the knot off of the tip of the haptic, but by starting with the right hand pocket, when you put tension on that suture, the worst thing that's going to happen is that knot is going to slide to the haptic optic junction and it won't come off of the IOL and you can always readjust that suture um, inside the eye. So always start with the right hand pocket. You can use 9 proline or CV8 Gore-Tex and by using a scleral pocket, uh, it has some advantages. It eliminates the need for conjunctival dissection, which is useful in patients who have pre-existing glaucoma blebs. Um, it's also useful in patients with a lot of conjunctival scarring, such as individuals who have squirrel buckles or post pars plane of vitrectomy. It covers the knot without the need for a rotation of the knot. It allows for simple four-point fixation, which should result in less lens tilt. And ultimately, it's more comfortable for the patients because there's no sutures in the conjunctiva. Thank you for your attention. Everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you, Richard, so much. Uh, Priya, it was a great presentation, really. Yeah, it was a great presentation, and we had a lot of uh, teaching uh, uh, tips from uh, Dr. Hoffman's uh, talk. So we move on to our next speaker, and then maybe we can have some discussion around. So we move on to Dr. Chi, and we know that she's a great surgeon. 
so we look forward to her uh, uh, talk and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Chi will be uh, talking about suture fixated IOLs. Hello everyone, I'd like to thank Ashwin for inviting me to speak on scleral suture of our else. These are my financial disclosures with no relevance to my talk today. Here is an eye that is a fake as well as in the reading and we are creating a scleral groove 2mm posterior limbus diametrically opposite. We then create a partial thickness 10mm incision superiorly. We thread a 26 gauge needle with cortex suture to create the suture snare. We clear all the vitreous and then we introduce the suture snare 1.75 mm posterior limbus. We extend a loop of the suture to lasso the end of a cortex suture bearing a needle. We do that for the opposite side and then we retrieve this to 1.75 mm posterior to the limbus. We now thread the needle through the eyelet of the module OL and railroad the needle through a 27 gauge needle, 1.75 mm posterior to the limbus at the fixation point. We repeat this for the other haptic eyelet, railroad the needle into a 27 gauge needle. We enlarge the incision now to 10 mm and introduce the LL into the anterior chamber which is being maintained by an anterior chamber maintainer. We then tighten the sutures and ensure that the LL is well centered. We close up the incision superiorly with 10 O nylon so that it is watertight at the stage and then we center the LL by adjusting the tension of the 211 knot. It's very important at this point in time to ensure that the knot is completely buried in the incision into the anterior chamber. You can see this diagrammatically on the left. You can use this technique for various types of IOLs as you can see here. Now this eye, we're going to show you how to do a 4-point scleral fixation with a 3-piece IOL, so 27 gauge needle docking the cortex suture at 1.75 mm posterior limbus through the Hoffman pocket which are placed diametrically opposite. We then retrieve the two sutures out of the incision temporally. We then tie one cut end of the suture to the haptic using the round turn and two half inch knots. We repeat that for the other suture and then we flange the haptic at the end so that this will not slip out. I'm going to show you now this knot on the left. The LL leading haptic is inserted to the anterior chamber which is being maintained by anterior chamber maintainer. We then do the same for the trailing haptic. So we have two suture point fixation per haptic using the round turn and two half inch knots as you can see here on the left, diagrammatically shown now, and then we flange the end of the haptic to ensure it doesn't slip out and introduce this into the anterior chamber as we tighten up the sutures. And by adjusting the tension of the sutures, we then center this L. We then retrieve the sutures from the Hoffman pocket and then we tie a 211 knot and allow the knot to slip back into this corneoscleral pocket. And at the end, we achieve a very well-centered, stable OL with a four-point fixation. So we're going to do a similar technique, but this time we are going to inject this OL and we have already pushed out the leading haptic, which we tie with two cut sutures, flange the tip, inject it into the anterior chamber, leave the haptic trailing outside, and then we tie on two more sutures, flange it, and then introduce this into the anterior chamber, tighten up the sutures to center the LOL. 
We then retrieve the sutures from the Hoffman pocket and finalize the lens. So in summary, we can fixate our L's with eyelids on haptics or three-piece our L's with Gore-Tex 7 old suture, avoid our L's with an interior square edge which will cause iris chaffing. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, it's very, 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 very uh, uh, great technique, uh, uh, she. Uh, excellent, excellent, really. A, a lot of teaching points, really. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, our next speaker is uh, Ehud Isaf. Uh, uh, he's one of the great inventors in ophthalmology, and uh, he's going to talk about the uh, suture fixation IOL with a 6 six uh, O double flange approach. Uh, can we start the video of Ayod, please? Hi, I'm Ayod Arsia and I would like to present to you suture fixation of intraocular lenses with 6 or prolin using adjustable flange technique. These are my disclosure, none is relevant to this presentation. Cedric and a brother from Brazil presented a technique for fixation of intraocular lenses using 5O prolen and designated punch. We have further modified this technique using 6O prolen and this suture has a very nice needle that can penetrate quite easily through the hydrophobic lens material. We create punch flanges on both sides and then the suture is externalized using a 27 or 30 gauge needle the IOL is implanted using folding forceps or designated cartridge and an injector. And once the IOL is inside the eye, the sutures are cut on the external part and flanges are created to fixate them to the scleral wall. Mm. Here is a clinical case of a patient after ICCE. We first uh, prepare the lens and note that the flanges are positioned at the back of the IOL away from the iris to prevent chafing. The lens is then uh, are inserted into the eye only after the suture are externalized. So this makes it very safe technique because the lens cannot drop posteriorly into the vitreous cavity now we cut short the suture and create the flanges using high temperature single-use cautery. And then we adjust the suture to create the proper tension and ensure that the lens is well stable and centralized. This is a patient and what day postoperative the same patient at one week we can see the internal flange on the left and the external one on the right covered with conjunctiva. Here is another case of a patient with a dropped nucleus after removal of the lens through a, a large incision. We externalize the suture and then implant the lens through this small pupil. And this is one major advantage of this technique because we do not need to do any intraocular manipulation uh, unlike other techniques so this make uh, this technique very safe even in small pupils. Now we externalize the suture cut and create flanges and stabilize the IOL. What about the hydrophilic lens? And here we studied it in the laboratory and we inserted the needle at various locations along the haptic and even at the very tip of this uh, thin haptic and also at the optic. As we can see, these uh, sutures are well fixated anywhere along the optic and using a considerable force, it does not come out. Here is a clinical case in which the IOL is inserted after the suture has been externalized. By pulling on both sides, we make sure that the IOL is well centered and then we cut the suture and create the external flanges and adjust to make sure that the lens is properly positioned. Alternatively, one can use closed loop, and this is the case of a patient with a Marfan syndrome. We enlarge a small pupil with the APX, makes a vitrectomy, and then implant an IOL. 
And in this case, after externalizing one suture, we pass the other side through both closed loops on each side. So eventually we have a four-point fixation, and this may create a, a very stable lens with no tilt and no need to penetrate through the lens material. The IOL is folded and I prefer to use folding forceps and pulling the suture on both sides ensure a uh, well positioned and well stable intraocular lens. One can use also PMMA lenses such as this one, aniridic lens with a brown color. And this patient luckily he had the colors of the eye with matching to the color of the IOL. So to summarize, adjustable flash technique using a 6O prolin can be used in a fakey guise in a variety of scleral fixation techniques either by passing the suture through the lens material of hydrophilic or hydrophobic materials, use either one-piece or three-piece design, passing the suture through the optic or through the optic, one can use closed loop or open loops or even PMMA. So this technique seems to be a very promising for IOL fixation in eyes with a fakia. And thank you very much for your very kind attention. Thank you so much, Ayud. It is it's really impressive. And I think we are going to have some questions in the end for each speaker. Uh, we are going to just to finish, but uh, uh, really we are going to have a, a question for everyone. So uh, our next um, speaker will going to be uh, Manuel uh, uh, Nicoli. He's going to uh, talk about the Lewis uh, Melbourne technique. Uh, please, Manuel. Hi, hi everyone. Good morning, everyone. I'm, I want to thank the invitation to, to, to Ashwin, to Shin, and especially Sergio. Uh, thank you very much for this, for being here, for, for the invitation. For being here, it's a very excellent course among these great uh, colleagues. So I'm going to talk about the uh, Malbrans technique. I think, I believe that he began this, this, this technique in 1985 he published the, 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 his work in 1986 at the International Ophthalmology. I recommend everyone to, to, to read that. I believe that he's the father of the uh, scleral sutures IOL. I have the chance to do my, my residency with him and I talked to him last night. I'm gonna show you some cases uh, on how he managed uh, his technique. He, you can use a foldable or uh, rigid IOL. You put the sutures, the 10-0 10, 10 uh, polypropylene technique. Then he moved to a 9-0 uh, polypropylene to, to do his technique. And here we see that he's doing the, uh, the marcation in the sclera, and he's going inside the sclera, inside the eye. Previously, you have to be sure that no vitreous is there, so anterior vitrectomy is mandatory. And he pulls the uh, first suture with these uh, forceps. It's a Sinsky uh, type of forceps. And then you pull the, the suture outside through the sclerotomies. And one thing he usually, he usually does is uh, he puts uh, another suture, a silk suture, through the uh, proline, and uh, he sutures the proline to the silk to every both ends of the of the silk. So he can have the uh, IOL suture quite firm and be very positive about the uh, the centration and and the outcomes of this surgery. So here we see he's doing the, uh, the silk with the proline suture. Here's another case where diatermy is done in the uh, sclera bed. Then he performs this uh, sclerotomy. He, he, he first uh, 
measure two or 2.5 millimeters from the uh, surgical limbus to do this, to put the uh, sclerotomies. Then he's using another type of lens. It's a PMMA lens with eyelets, so you can put the uh, sutures in those eyelets. And he puts the, uh, insert the, the lens, and he managed to retrieve the sutures from the eyelets outside the eye and make the suture as we saw prior to the first surgery. These were cases of, uh, of penetrating keratoplasties and he's putting the, the silk the suture and suturing between the proline and the silk to have the the lens very very firm. So here we see, here we see the end of the, the this case. Here we have another case. Here's the same, but he uses a, a this crescent to make some uh, room in the sclera, so we can hide the, the knot in the sclera. And here we can say that it's a complex case with a penetrating keratoplastic uh, needed. So we are passing through the uh, the, the needle from one sclerotomy and we are using the other sclerotomy to do the same. Here we, we don't have any problems to 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 injure the cornea because we're going to we're going to replace it. We put the suture on the 3P 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 lens and we are going to insert the, the lens over the, uh, the incision, and then you can see how, how the suture is pulled out, and then you have the, uh, the lens in position. Then the case goes with the penetrating keratoplasty, and finally, you do the, the sutures just to center and to adjust the lens in the correct uh, place. The uh, modification that we are talking about now is that Lewis modification, modification was to use a needle to use as a guide for the for the sutures for the and then and then you can use in a proper way these 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 sutures and also uh, Dr. Malbran incorporated uh, in 1987 1988 the uh, this clerals, uh, this this clerals, uh, for uh, flaps for to, to hide the the knots. So to make sure that no exposures of the knots uh, can occur and maybe uh, endostomitis uh, risk be much very lower. So thank you for your attention and thanks again for the invitation. So that was a great talk. I think we'll have a discussion in the end. Meanwhile, we move on to our next speaker, Dr. David Chang. And uh, David Chang, we all know, uh, we all look forward to listening to him. And he's a legend in himself. So Dr. David Chang, we are all ears to your talk on ACIO implantation. Yes, well, thank you very much. Of course, uh, anterior chamber IOLs get no respect, but I'm happy to talk about them because in a lot of surveys, it shows this still is one of the most common ways of IOL fixation without a capsular bag. Uh, in our textbook, uh, we highlighted all of these different <coughs> methods for non-capsular fixation, but I'll point out the only one that's FDA approved is the anterior chamber uh, IOL. Now, here is one that I have to remove. And uh, you'll see that the lens has actually been placed upside down. There is fibrosis, and this is only after four months. But there's fibrosis in the angle. In fact, I have to amputate uh, the uh, distal haptic. And the point is that, of course, if you don't implant or, or don't use any of these techniques properly, there will be complications, and that goes for every single uh, technique that has been described in anterior chamber lenses, of course, uh, are no exception. 
And I think what is, you know, this is a good surgeon that's placed this upside down, but it just shows that in the heat of battle, we can do things that don't work out, but that doesn't mean the technique is always wrong. Sizing is important. So here are three sizes for the Alcon uh, Kelman Multiflex. And for the, the typical eye, the middle size works well, but even you can uh, remove one after you've placed it if you think it's too large or too small. So let's look at some situations. Here's a bag IOL a Sudafaco Denesis, but it's a PMMA uh, IOL with a large optic. So I already have a large incision. I've done a vitrectomy. And then this is the technique. The sheet glide goes to the opposite angle. There's viscoelastic above the sheet glide. You make sure that the lens is not upside down. It is basically vaulted away from the iris. Now I hold it against the uh, temporal nasal uh, angle. I pull out the glide and then you're dropping the haptic uh, just inside the incision. And then I'll use usually some type of, uh, this is a luster hook to sort of flex the haptic to make sure you're not tucking the iris in the angle. And sometimes you can walk it, uh, in this case, clockwise, just to be sure that we're completely free. There should be no unusual peaking of the pupil. And if it's too tight, you can simply remove it. There's a a uh, running suture, a final cleanup with the vitrectomy, and uh, this case becomes very fast and it's very secure, and we have a good uh, IOL uh, power prediction because the effective lens position is always uh, known. There's another case where the nucleus was descending through um, posterior capsule rupture in a Flomax case, so I'm using a PAL technique to extract the nucleus. Now I've got a huge incision. We do our vitrectomy. You'll see there's a temporary closure. We put in myocol and then take out one suture, insert the sheet's glide. So the same technique, this keeps you from uh, <clears throat> entrapping the iris on the way in. We hold it against the opposite angle. We make sure we're free. Uh, and then this flexes it. You make sure the haptic is not in coming out of the incision. And then uh, you can make the iridotomy either with a vitrector or here with the large incision. Uh, just do it the old-fashioned way. And uh, we close the sclerot sclerotomy, and there is the case. So the uh, earliest OTA from the Academy was just updated uh, literally in the last uh, two months. Uh, and this is a study that looked at the entire literature. They only found 45 articles that were at least level three, which is basically a, a small case report. But they concluded again that uh, based on uh, acuity and safety, no single superior method, uh, a CME and retinal attachment and glaucoma were actually higher with uh, sutured PC IOLs, chronic uveitis, a little bit more with uh, AC IOLs. So I think we can say there's some relative indications, uh, aphakia uh, with uh, an intact hyloid, as we used to see with uh, primary intracaps, a large incision where you've already done a vitrectomy. Contraindications might be glaucoma, any type of irritable corneal adhesions, a high risk of needing a DSEC, DMEC later on, and iris defects. But for many people, this is what they are comfortable with, and you just have to make sure you use the, uh, the correct tech. Thank you. Uh, that was a great talk, uh, Dr. David. Uh, for the benefit of uh, the audience, uh, we all know that the sizing of the anterior chamber IOL is very important. So it, uh, could you like to give just one tip to the audience? How would they decide the right kind of size for that patient, particular patient? So it should be the white to white plus uh, 1 to 1 1.5 millimeters. So uh, in our case in the U.S., the MT4 pretty much meets 80% of the eyes, but you need to have all three sizes there. Uh, and uh, so basically the MT4 is going to uh, typically be the, the best size. That overall length of that lens is 13 millimeters. Um, nice. So uh, a question to Isabel. Uh, about uh, the retroperiphery uh, very size. Uh, thanks for the needle uh, orientation. This is very nice, but 
Sometimes when you put uh, the uh, this fake IOL, you see the haptic little bit kinked. So how you deal with this, and uh, uh, what's your tips when you put? You know how do you take a good iris tissue in the fixation. Well, I have um, a follow up with several a uh, lot of cases. So this needle. I don't see any damage in the in the haptics in the the claw, okay? Because it's very flexible. Um, some colleagues try with another type of needle, and uh, this is important because it uh, provoke um, damage of the the claw. And um, at first, I also have um, uh, some um, afraid because it's enough or not. It is enough, and then. Um, I try and uh, I see that uh, the claw uh, um, locked the 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 needed the the iris needed. So I think it's not problem. I have no no luxation or or the um, uh, dislocation of the IOL. So I think uh, it's enough. Not need no uh, large and uh, it's because we have um, the needle is like a guide. If the, the claw uh, locked the needle, it's enough. Thank you. I just want to uh, ask you, suppose if you do not have a good amount of iris tissue out there, what would be, what would be your choice, next choice of uh, secondary eye wall fixation? Uh, I don't understand the question, sorry. Um, it's for me? Yeah, yeah, it's for you. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to know what would be your second preference of uh, secondary eye oil fixation. Suppose if you do not have adequate amount of iris tissue out there to put up the lens, what would you choose next? Well, depend of type of lens. I, did, I, I use very much um, uh, I, um, suture to the iris because it's uh, very uh, interesting. If I have iris, I suture the, the, the IOL and then if not, I, I try to suture because I, I use uh, often pockets because I suture a lot of the rings and then I, I suture if it, uh, a single piece, it's not a lot, to, it's not a very good idea. So I, I try to, um, I suture uh, with the scleropox and, the, the, um, and the, um, with nine or perlin, no problem. Uh, my my question my question to Ehud, uh, how uh, you uh, choose the best site uh, in the IOL to go through, and did you find any uh, IOL uh, opacification in the long term or no? Um, first of all, I will start with opacification. That, that is not a, a problem with uh, uh, these lenses. Once because. Uh, uh, Use usually hydrophobic lenses and uh, they do not opacify. Listen, yes, so opacification, not really. Uh, my preference is that I, I prefer to suture lenses and I either go with a needle through the, the lens optic or use uh, four closed loop uh, lenses. And I find this uh, 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 the most uh, uh, easiest uh, to use. As for the power calculation, I do not do any modification. I use the same as in the bag because the location is approximately the same. And I don't see any uh, significant deviation. It is not as accurate, but no significant deviation from my calculation. Can I ask a question, Ehud? Yeah, Have sure. you ever tried to remove the haptics just so that the haptics aren't causing a problem down the road? Uh, yes, to, to cut the haptics. Uh, um, I, I did in, in a couple of cases. They do not interfere. They, they have no value as for the fixation, but they do not interfere. But in a couple of cases, they just cut the optics because they, they are not part of the fixation. Then they just, you correct, they may rub the ciliary bodies, which we do not like to, but uh, we can cut them off. Uh, Dr. Chi, I would like to ask you that you uh, implanted the um, any NIRIDIA type of file you showed in one of the videos. Have you ever noticed any pigment dispersion in these uh, IOLs over a period of time? Um, not really. I think as long as there's no tilt in the LL, although it's through a single eyelet. In fact, that patient that I was doing it in happened to be a patient with both Koyanagi Harada's disease. And you would imagine an eye with uveitis would have more inflammation with the slightest chaffing. But no, I don't see it generally. Uh, 
can I ask Hoffman uh, how we do you know uh, that that the exact size uh, of the thickness uh, during doing the Hoffman pocket? All right, so I start out the pocket with a diamond step knife that's set at 350 microns, and then I will lift up on that posterior lip and go in with a metal crescent blade, like an Alcon crescent blade. And uh, it's helpful if you can see the blade through the conjunctiva and the sclera. Um, you can go too deep and you can be too superficial. But it's you basically what would like to see just barely see the blade as you're making the dissection. You want to angle the dissection. Uh, you don't want to angle down. You want to angle in the plane of the sclera. Does that answer the question? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is great. Can I just make a comment on the Hoffman pocket, which I use uh, a lot of? So I think. Uh, Could I just yes, make a comment? Yes. Yeah, I, I think you can use the IOCT, intraoperative yes. OCT, and that can also be a useful guide. Okay, but no. Yeah, I think, yes, that is. Do you hear me now? It's a good idea. Uh, yes, I think uh, it was a very great yeah. session. And uh, we enjoyed a lot of different uh, topics in, uh, in, uh, in covering everything in the, in the course. Thank you for everyone, and thank you for Ashvin, uh, Sergio, uh, Shane, and everyone is here. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Priya, Priya thank I, lo you. I love your new hair, okay? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I told her, I told her this, that there is <laughs> let's, let's move on uh, for the last session. Uh, my friend Ton, my friend Gerardo, will you take the, the words to, to start the, this, this session three? And Carlo, I'm waiting your, your IOL here in Brazil for test, okay? Okay, thank you, thank you, Gerardo. Have the intro, please. <laughs> Well, hello everyone. My name is uh, Tom Oning, and uh, I want to welcome everyone here with Gerardo. We're going to do the uh, moderation of this next session. First off, you just can't go on without saying yeah, thank you to uh, Ash and Sergio and Shin for setting this up. I mean, it's amazing, and, and, and it's another great example of taking advantage of the bad situation of uh, COVID and uh, bringing us all tighter and tighter together. And I just can't thank you all for the effort. Uh, to set this up. So we have a great session to finish it off, session three. And we're going to um, start off with uh, a video from um, Gabar Sheroff. Now, Gabar, I believe, is halfway in the middle of a case. And so I'm not 100% sure uh, if he's going to be able to comment too much. But we've got a video. And he got, he got interscleral haptic fish fixation all started in 2007. Uh, with a uh, very innovative approach. So let's, let's start off with uh, Dr. Uh, Sheriff's video. Please. I would like to talk about our 15 years of experience with intraskeral haptic fixation technique in eyes with insufficient or no capsular support. In this video, I like to illustrate you the basic steps of this technique. Conjunctiva has been opened superior and inferiorly. A pass planar infusion can be used, or like in this case, an anterior chamber maintainer. And then a 23 gauge cannula is used to create a ciliary sulcal sclerotomy. The second ciliary sulcal sclerotomy should be exactly 180 degrees to the first one. From inside the sclerotomy, a new fresh cannula and limbus parallel intraspheral tunnel of about 2 mm in length is created. The same on the opposite side, again with a new fresh cannula. Now a three-piece IOL, in this case an AR40 sensor, is implanted through a corneal tunnel of about 2.6 to 2.8 millimeters. The trailing haptic is trapped into corneal incision. Now I'm using two special design forceps, one is straight, one is curved. And with the so-called handshake technique, I'm presenting the haptic 
intraocularly, go with the straight forceps to the sclerotomy and grasp the very tip of the haptic and externalize it temporarily. The same procedure is done on the other side. Again, both haptics are used. The haptic is implanted intraocular. Second haptic and the handshake technique is used to grasp the haptic intraocular, present it to the straight forceps which is coming through the sclerotomy, grasp the very tip. This prevents breaking or damaging the haptic while you externalize it to the sclerotomy. This moment you have a very stable situation. The IOL cannot fall down. I grasp again now with the curved forceps, the very tip of the haptic, push it a bit back in the sclerotomy and then introduce it into the intraspheral tunnel. When I went through the tunnel, I opened the jaws of the forceps, release the haptic, and pull the forceps back. And then the same is done on the opposite side. It is very important that all parts of the haptic are fully intraspheral. This prevents late erosion and complications of this technique. Another beauty of this technique is that at the end of the surgery you still have the opportunity for what I call fine-tuning of the IOL. Another advantage of this technique is that it is completely independent from the iris. So like in this case, 30 years after severe trauma with aniridia and aphakia, you can use this technique to safely implant an IOL. And we found that an IOL is much more stable um, in intraspheral haptic fixation than in transclerally suture fixated IOLs, and that there is much less risk for an IOL tilt. Like in this case, you can even implant an artificial iris to improve the outcome. What are the recommendations for intraskleral haptic fixation? Symmetrical ciliary sulcal sclerotomies, 1.5 to 2 mm postlimbal, exactly 180 degrees from each other. A limbus parallel intraskleral tunnel preferred either with a 23 gauge or 24 gauge cannula or 23 gauge MVR blade. A vitrectomy should be performed. Capsulectomy should be performed. A continuous infusion to stabilize the eye, either as an AC maintainer or a pulse planar for infusion. Complete intrascleral haptic fixation. Please use proper instrumentations like the forceps we have designed. In case of leakage at the end of the surgery, please suture all sclerotomies. With about 15 years of experience in intrascleral haptic fixation, we found no contraindication except excessive sclerotomalacia. It's a standardized technique and uses standard PCI oils. That means no extra storage and easy logistics. For the biometry and IOL calculation, we use the SRKT formula and calculate for intracapsular positioning of the IOL. We found an excellent centration, like on the right you see a multifocal IOL several years post-operative, well centered without any tilt. It's a sutureless technique and sclerofixation. And the sclera is the strongest tissue in the eye. It shows minimal uveal contact and reduces the risk for UGH syndrome. It is completely independent from iris changes and can be even applied in aneuridic eyes. You can use special IOLs like multifocal or toric IOLs. On the right bottom you see one eye 10 years post-operative. And here is the uh, uh, IOL haptic visible shining through the sclera and the conjunctiva without any sign of um, leakage or inflammation. Thank you very much for your attention. And do Okay, great. Great technique. Uh, we continue and then at the end we make all the questions, okay? Now, with our friend Ashvin Agarwal, you talk about IOL glue.
Well, uh, thank you so much, Gerardo. And uh, must I say, you know, it, this all started with Gebor uh, back in the day. And uh, we've just basically adapted from there and adapted from there. And it, it's gone on a long way. Uh, my topic today is uh, were, uh, in, in this course is the glued intraocular lens. And I think it's uh, only but I have no financial interest in uh, anything else but ELISA, which has nothing to do with the talk today. Uh, the specific instruments that I would say that, you know, if you are starting off to do this procedure and it's important to know is uh, you must have a basic vitrectomy setup. You must have a glued intraocular lens marker uh, and glued IOL forceps, uh, two of them in number to be precise and trocar AC maintainer. If you have a three piece intraocular lens and some fibrin glue, apart from obviously the other cataract stuff that you already have or you need in your practice. Uh, let's start with a complication that happens. You know, you probably have a zonular dialysis like this. And what exactly do you do? You basically switch the wound and you put in a trocar, uh, anterior or posterior maintainer. After you do that, you really are using this flap marker. And I'm talking more about the stuff that really belongs to glued intraocular lens than anything else. Uh, so, uh, you know, making the scleral flaps is very important, two by two millimeters in size. Uh, once you've done this, you basically are making sclerotomies after the infusion is making it taut. Then you make the sclerotomies under the flat, approximately 0.75 to a millimeter behind the limbus. And uh, that does make a big difference. So yeah, that's why I, the range is important. Once you do this, you actually go ahead and make a paracentesis. You already have your main port wound, which is why I caused this complication of a zonular dialysis while I was doing my FACO. And once you do that, you basically are removing your uh, any cortical matter that's left al along with the bag remnants and vitreous. So basically, it's a combination of three things that are being removed with a vitrectomy cutter. And that's what we're doing with this uh, in, in this step. Surgery and technique presentation. Once you're doing, uh, once you've done this, you basically now have to externalize the haptics using a handshake technique. And just in interest of time, I'm going to just show, or in the interest of the step, I'm going to show this one video again. Uh, you're basically going in and externalizing one. Then you're using a handshake technique of basically using both hands so that you can bring out both the haptics through the sclerotomies. Once they're out of the sclerotomies, you basically are making the Gibal Shariat's tunnel, uh, which is very, very important and probably the key to the whole success of uh, all the procedures that we see. Uh, you know, you really have to tuck them somewhere and the sclera is probably the best place to tuck an uh, uh, intraocular lens. Some small tricks which can be used, don't hold it vertical uh, or don't hold it parallel, hold it perpendicular and you'll be able to insert that into the groove uh, that you've made already. And you can go as far as you want. The best part about this whole thing is you can tighter this. Uh, the next point that I would want to add is you want to put in some pilocarpine. If pilocarpine sometimes doesn't work, you sometimes get a little bit of optic capture like the or iris capture like this. And when you get this, please go ahead and do a pupiloplasty of your choice. My choice is the single pass four throw. Uh, it's easiest, it's fastest, and there's no way that you can get faster than this. So uh, a pupiloplasty just avoids any kind of uh, iris capture that you might have. Uh, you then close up by removing the Trocar, if you have posted in a, tro a posterior or anterior, glue up that flap and that really tucks it in, into place. Uh, post three weeks, you will also have fibrosis around that. Uh, it's easy, it's pretty simple. And also you see a very quiet eye uh, immediate post-operatively. Uh, some summary points, and I'll show you one tricky case after this is uh, switch of the wounds, you have peritomy, then you place a trocar for infusion or getting the eyeball taut. Fashion out your scleral flaps two by two millimeters. Use a sclerotomy, uh, 0.75 millimeters. Anterior vitrectomy is then done and externalize the haptic using the handshake technique. Tuck them with using a Gebor Chariot standard. Either use a pilocarpine or use some pupiloplasty, whichever uh, deems fit for that case. Close off and see your post ops always. Uh, one special scenario which I wanted to talk about uh, is this case, which has a sommering ring all around. You're basically doing a, you're making your flaps before you even do anything. It's an AFA kick eye. A uh, patient was 27 years old, probably done. The case was done where he was very, very young. And I'm making a trocar AC maintainer in this case, 
once I've got my eyeball taut, I'm making my sclerotomies under the flaps, making sure that it goes under the iris and under the somering ring. Uh, once that is done, I'm performing my anterior vitrectomy. Now, without disturbing that somering ring, basically I have to use that two millimeter or three millimeter optic of the capsule uh, to go in and perform my glued and drop level. That way, this is very forgiving because even a three millimeter pupil is more than enough to actually perform the glued IOL part of it. Now, it is for the somering ring part of it that I really need to expand the pupil and actually visualize what I'm doing here. So, what I what I'm doing here is basically tucking my making sure that all my haptics are tucked now that gives me a rock solid bed to basically bring out all these somering ring pieces on top uh, quadrant by quadrant so my iris hooks on the other quadrants are all out now i can use two techniques one is a burping technique so i basically burp these uh, uh, these somering ring pieces because they are honestly just like cataract they are as thick as cataract you try and take them with a vitrectomy cutter you'll you'll be sitting there for 45 minutes just trying to cut and causing more and more inflammation in that eye uh, the other point the other step which you can do like in this piece this was a rather large piece that i had to uh, you know burp out you couldn't burp this out even if you wanted to so you probably have to use a phaco emulsification and that glued IOL over there acted like a scaffold and did not allow my piece to fall down inside the retina and that's the big advantage of doing this uh, glued IOL before you actually go ahead and take care of any somering ring. Once that is done, you basically take off the trocars uh, and put in some glue and this is the post-operative uh, vision of that patient. Uh, this is all I had for you today. I wanted to uh, also thank you. Uh, and Sergio and Shin for helping me uh, be here. Wow, thank you very much. Boy, that, that was such a beautiful description uh, of a classic technique. Uh, next is um, Amar, who has been such a mentor for me over the years. There's been times when I've panicked and emailed him and asked him for advice on this technique, and I just can't thank you enough for your support. Uh, we are... Um, we are going to go into maybe some more complex cases uh, with Amar and the same technique. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, for your lovely, kind words. I'll just share my screen for a minute and let me know if my video is playing. Yes, great, Amar. Okay. So basically, if you see this video, you notice, first of all, this patient has got pseudophagic bullous cardiopathy. But look at that, the cornea is white. Now I'm making my scleral flaps. I'm making a scleral tunnel because I can see there is an AC IOL inside that eye. I cannot see anything. So I thought I'll take off the epithelium, which is so hypertrophic there to see something slightly better. Now always have fluid in the eye. As Ashwin showed, either a trocar AC maintainer or a trocar infusion cannula. Now, if your flaps are not 180 degrees, I see that I make them 180 degrees. Now I'm making my sclerotomy and I always do a posterior vitrectomy because in this case, I do not know whether the surgeon has dropped a nucleus, IUL, anything could be inside. So I do a posterior vitrectomy and even through this hazy cornea, you can still do it. Now what the next step is, I made my scleral tunnel incision and my problem is to take out this IUL. These IOLs get entrapped into the iris. So you have to be careful when you remove them because they can either produce an iris dialysis while removal or they can produce a bleed. The IOL has come broken, but does not matter. Now I'm taking off one more haptic there and you can see there's a third haptic coming out, but still I have one more haptic which is lodged onto the iridectomy there. I'm trying to remove it slowly and carefully and remember, during this procedure, my fluid is still on. Still, with this difficulty, still I've got the bleed. But touch wood, it's not much. So now, my next step is to take the lens inside. Since I already have a large incision, I can just push it like a non-foldable IUL, catch the first haptic inside, externalize it. Now I do the handshake technique. So watch it, I'm transferring the haptic from one hand to the other, catching it. Now my first IOL forceps goes inside through the sclerotomy. 
catches the second haptic there on the tip and externalizes. And as Ashwin said, even through a small pupil, you can still do it very well. Now we move to Gabor's tunnel there, and I've taken a 26 gauge needle. Look at the amount of haptic externalize. That is the key. If you do not have enough haptic externalize, please come more anterior. In which case, you might have to do a small iridectomy also so that you don't damage the iris. But in this case, I've got enough haptic externalize to tuck into Gabor's tunnel there. So once I've got it inside, now look at my pupil. I need to make this slightly smaller. So Ashwin talked about this, but just to recap on this, we do the single pass four throw pupilplasty. On one side, just going through a straight 10-0 or 9-0 proline needle suture that goes through clear cornea. On the other side, remember you have a paracentesis. So remember paracentesis is needed only on one side where you're going to bring the loop out. Now I pass a 30 gauge needle through that into the iris, railroad the two, bring the suture out. Now I brought this first loop out. So this is the single pass. Now remember the number four, just pass it four times and that is game, set and match. Normally you do three, two, two or something like two, two, two or whatever you want. Here you've just done four times and it's over. That's it. So it's a very simple procedure which anyone can do. Here you can see through the clear cornea, I passed the needle, brought it out. Now I bring that loop out. That's the loop out. And look at my assistant is using an endo eliminator from outside so that I can see better. Remember the number four. So why four? Because if you do three, it will open. Five does not open, but four also does not open. So you don't need five. So the simple procedure is four and that's it. You don't need anything more. It's a simple procedure which anyone can do. Now, once I have done that, why have I done this? Look what I've done. Air will remain in the eye. Two, any closed angle will become an open angle. Three, any astigmatism is gone because I made it like a pinhole pupil. So these three procedures help the solution die. Now I take the endothelium. Look, you're looking at the eye. You're looking at the endothelium from the top. I only do, we only do PDEC. We don't do DMEX. Because please understand, when you do DMEX, your donors are above 50. You cannot strip off the endothelium in donors unless the patient is, uh, donor is about 40 or 50 years of age. In DSEC, it's too thick. PDEC has advantages of both DMEC and DSEC. So here you see we are creating a bubble. How do you create this bubble? That's the bubble is created. This is a type 1 bubble. And we started this technique with the help of, with, in collaboration with Harminda Dua also. Look at the bubble. It does not go to the periphery. So where is the air? You have endothelium, you have desmes, then you have the duas layer, then the air. That's the PDEC bubble. If it went to the periphery, you would create a DMEC graft. I enter into this with a knife, stain it, and once I've stained it, all I do is dissect it. Those who want eye banks in America, you just have to call them up and tell them to give, me a, give you a PDEC graft because Ashwin has shown them how to prepare it. Only question is, please go for donors below 40. We never touch donors above 35 or 40. Once I have done this graft ready, I all I need to do is create another trocar for air. So I've got one trocar in the back for fluid, one trocar in the front pushing me air. So all I have to do is take off my bad desmase endothelium complex. So I'm taking this off as you can strip it off just like you normally do in any endothelial keratoplasty. Once you have done that, take your graft, load it any technique, whichever you want, because it works like a DMEC graft and inject it inside. Again, unrolling a PDEC is extremely easy. You can manipulate it. A DMEC graft will tear. In this, it will not tear. So I've just unrolled it, put in air. This is an air pump assisted PDEC. I've got air continuously flowing inside the eye. See how I can move the graft. You can't do that in a DMEC graft. In this, I can center my graft apply the glue, seal everything down. Now the question comes at the end of the day, how did this patient behave? So let's see at the end of the day, when the case is completed, how this patient behaved. So you are seeing now intraoperatively on table, how the case looks. Now we move to the next step. Look at the patient, two weeks post-op, how the patient is, one month post-op, Two months post-op, look at the patient, has improved to 6-9 vision, 
three months post-op and you compare it to the pre-op, you'll see and look at the final picture, ladies and gentlemen. You have the pre-op, you can't even see the IUL and look at the post-op and that's the beauty of the PDEC procedure. So here we have done a glued IUL, then we did a explantation of the IUL. Before that, we did the vitrectomy, we did the fourth row pupillosity and finally ended it with PDEC. So I'd like to stop sharing the screen and hand it over to Tom and to Gerardo. Incredible, Amar. Incredible as usual. Well, uh, we continue now with the great Jim Jamane. Jim, I'm the president of the fan club Jamane in Argentina. Did you know it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let's go, Jim. My talk is about Jamane technique, vouchers. Today, I'd like to show you my personal tips of Yamane technique. I first inject OVD and make PI, peripheral ridectomy, using vitrector. I do not dilate the pupil before surgery. PI, I performed subtenon anesthesia because the anesthesia induced pupil dilation. After vitrectomy, I removed the dislocated IOL using Fukuoka technique. Maybe Dr. Fukuoka will tell us the detail of this technique. I set needle stabilizer and make two square thumbnails using 30 g symbol needles. The skeleton nails were made two millimeters from the limbus. In this moment, I align the IOP to 40 millimeters monthly. Then I inserted the IOL on the iris. The main wound was made. 70 degrees from the left square thumbnail. I pulled the IOL upward to make easy to grasp the leading haptic. I grasped two millimeters from the tip of the leading haptic and inserted it into the needle about half of the haptic. I glassed two millimeters from the trailing haptic and insert into the needle. In this moment, I twisted left hand to make the direction of the trailing haptic goes downward to insert into the needle. Then the haptics were externalized with the needles. I externalized one side and last and pushed back. Then externalized the another side. This maneuver is necessary to avoid slippage of the haptic and I confirmed the tilt of the IOL by watching the reflection of the corner and IOL. Then the haptics were trimmed and dry up and make making French. My French was coming smaller compared to three years ago. And the franges are fixed completely inside the square thumbnail. Finally, I removed trochal canures or vitrectomy. And 
adjust it as you need. There are many tips of the Yamane technique. Please find your personal tips for mastering this technique. Well, thank you so much uh, for that. Um, our next speaker, and then let me just mention that we're going to have discussion uh, at, at the end. So we're saving our discussion for the end, just so you uh, understand. And we have some exciting uh, discussion, including a, a bonus video by Shishiko, who's going to tell us uh, a really cool thing. So that's a little teaser for the end. But for right now, we're going to um, have Brian Kim, who, who uh, Dr. Yamani mentioned uh, some variations of the technique. And Brian Kim has got some really cool variations uh, on YouTube uh, and other media. Uh, that I have followed, and, and so I'm really excited to have Brian um, talk to us about his modifications to this technique. Brian is the master in this technique, right? Oh, I am st still a pupil under Dr. Yamane. <laughs> well, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, great. Well, Dr. Oding, uh, thank you for that nice invitation uh, and uh, introduction. Uh, I. I've been watching you for years, even as a resident, and uh, in all your teaching videos. So thank you from afar for teaching me uh, cataract surgery and all these complicated techniques. Thanks to Ashvin, Sergio, and uh, Shin for having me. Uh, obviously, I'm following uh, Obi Wan Kenobi of Yamani technique, uh, and so I'm not going to be able to uh, do anything more than what he does. Uh, but hopefully, for the learning surgeons. I can help break down kind of the complexities of this technique. So I have no financial interests. So imagine this case, uh, you are learning skull fixated techniques and you have this aphakic patient who needs a secondary IOL, but the problem is this patient is anoritic as well. And so you're wanting to choose the Yamani skull fixation technique, but there are some challenges. So number one, the leading haptic is usually placed on top of the iris when you deliver the optic, but this patient does not have any iris to support the leading haptic. Secondly, when the leading haptic is fixated into the left side needle, the trailing haptic can be difficult to cannulate the right side needle. And so this is the solution that I came up with to make things easier for me. And this is a trailing haptic first modification, which was published in 2018. And essentially, you want to externalize the leading haptic through a contralateral limbal incision, and this secures the IOL from descending into the vitreous space, but this also improves access to the trailing haptic for needle fixation. There are a few other things I want to discuss here. So accurate scleral needle placement. So, you know, we're marking the conjunctiva, but the conjunctiva is a mobile structure. And so if you're not careful, your, your markings and where you want to actually place the needle through the sclera will not be the same. And therefore you can have tilt and other issues. And secondly, the, if the eye is soft, it's very difficult to cannulate and it causes the globe to collapse. And so the solution has been stated before by all the other excellent speakers is that you need to have continuous infusion. You need a firm globe to pass the needle through the sclera. And I use a Lewicki 20 gauge. I used to use a 23 gauge, and I'm using a 20 now. And that's just to increase that volume. You wanna hold the conjunctiva in the neutral position for scleral needle placement so that your conjunctival marks actually reflect the scleral needle placement. And lastly, proper scleral tunnel is very important to have a nice scleral platform to minimize tilt. Unfortunately, I've seen many surgeons just dive in through the, through the needle, uh, through the sclera. And if you don't have a nice scleral shelf or a platform, that's what leads to tilt and uh, poor lens placement. And so this is just a video quickly showing what I'm referring to. The trocar is held with forceps to stabilize the eye. You can see that the conjunctival marks are not distorted with the needle pass. On the left side here, I'm holding the limbus with the forceps and doing the same maneuver. Again, you're wanting the conjunctiva to reflect the scleral needle placement. Docking the haptic on the needle. So the haptic is curved and the needle is, is straight. And this is why people can struggle to cannulate the haptic through the needle. And so the solution is to dock the haptic on the bevel of the needle first, 
but don't advance it yet because you have to straighten the haptic against the bevel and then it should slide easily into the needle. And you never want to force the haptic into the needle when it's not straight. The haptic must face the bevel of the needle to, fill, to facilitate the docking. And so the left side needle is facing away from you, the right side towards you, but it's always facing the haptic. So here is the video, the bevel is up, the bevel is toward you, the bevel is down, and it's difficult to cannulate. And this is because the needle is straight, but the haptic is curved. You want to dock the haptic towards the bevel, which is away from you, straighten the haptic, and then you can advance the haptic. So why do people talk about the trailing haptic being a problem? And I was thinking about this and it was hard to articulate until I realized it's actually called I'm calling it the tug of war effect. And so what do I mean? Once the leading haptic is fixed to the left side needle, the trailing haptic needs to be pulled towards the left to straighten the, and thread the trailing haptic into the right side needle. But there is a tug of war effect because the left side needle haptic complex resists the straightening of the trailing haptic. And so you will see that here. It's very difficult to control the haptic when you're holding it too far, and that's number one, but also the left haptic is tethered to the left needle, so it's harder to thread the right haptic. And this is a problem with the trailing haptic. And so this really encapsulates everything I'm referring to. The technician advances the IOL and the surgeon externalizes the leading haptic to, through the microforceps, through the limbal incision, the trailing haptic is captured into the incision in a U-shaped configuration. The apex of the U is the ideal place to grasp the haptic. Note the bevel of the needle is facing the haptic. You straighten the haptic and then tunnel through. The leading haptic is internalized. In this case, you could, I'm putting it on the iris, but you don't have to. You can try to do all the maneuvers together. So the leading haptic is tethered in the same exact way, again, flattening the haptic and then straightening through the needle. And then of course, you wanna pull each haptic out. And uh, this is the end of the case here. So in summary, Dr. Shin Yamane, Yamane really developed an innovative and elegant sclerofixated technique, but there are some technical challenges for the learning surgeon. And I do believe these modifications help to flatten and kind of articulate and explain what's going on and uh, I hope this was helpful to you. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, happy to field them. Thank you again for having me. Okay, great idea, uh, Brian, really great. Well, we continue with uh, the master Sergio Canabrava. I present you in Spanish, in Portuguese, or in English. Sergio is a friend. Uh, he, he has in French, French, in French. Let's in talk French. in French. I <laughs> I, I just speak a little in English. <laughs> Sergio is my friend. He's, he's, he has great ideas. And well, show you one of these ideas, please. Thank you, Gerardo. It's a pleasure. Let's start. Today, are you. Can you listen to me? Yes, man. Yes, let's go. Uh, today I will talk about the Canabrava for flange technique peers. Uh, here my disclosure. Every of my oh, okay today I will talk about flange polypropylene tests six o five zero polypropylene, which IOL should you use in flange size? Every of my talks I I say thanks for your money to publish this 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 flange because he opened doors for every bar. And let's talk first about the double flange tests uh, late of 2017 with adjustable uh, polypropylene. Here uh, is clever simulation test to, to see how the flange in the polypropylene stays stable. Here are breaking test, as you can see, how the, the six and the five zero polypropylene is, is stable and uh, the polypropylene helped to break and the flange did not break. And here, uh, I'm honored because this double flange, uh, many surgeons around the world use this double flange concept uh, that nobody is stay talking about it between uh, 2017 and 2019. And it's an honor for me to open this, this door. 
And today I will show the peers about the no foldable cannabis technique and the foldable cannabis technique. 6050, I suggest for no foldable IOL 50 and 26 gauge needle. And for foldable IOL, I, I like to use for eyelets IOL 29 ga gauge with large uh, lumen and 60 polypropylene suture. This is important point to, to show in the peers of the technique. Which IOL should you, I use? And, uh, in no photo IOL, you use a traditional Lewis and Malbrand IOL for the technique. And for eyelets IOL, we have men in the world. Acros IOL, uh, that was the IOL that I start to publish the technique because the one IOL that you have in Brazil, but you have Micropur from Physio, it's hydrophobic IOL, hydrophobic, artist from Crystalline France, hydrophobic too, and Mini 4, after is for eyelets too. You have happened IOL in, in Russia too. Okay, no photo insertion, the first peel is important. Observe in this video, it, you need to insert the IOL first. You need to do a scleral tunnel. I don't like to do a corneal tunnel because a large incision. And you do a scleral tunnel and insert it in the sucos. It's important to insert the IOL in the sucos. And look, my left rent, I push, I pull the, 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 the polypropylene. And then a pronation movement. And now you can see how the IOL in the sucos in a good position. And observe the, the 50 polypropylene. One 50 polypropylene in one side and another in another opposite side because you need to create a long tunnel like in Yamani technique. A previous polypropylene test and needle angulation. Observe, it's important to test the six or the five zero uh, polypropylene inside the needle before to start and important to, to mark the position of the, the, the scleral tunnel and observe now, the angulation is so important. You need to do a long tunnel to, to uh, do this technique. Okay, flange side. Uh, the right side, you have the bad size. Every surgeon, including me, when we start the technique, we start with a, with a, a large flange. It's not good. You can, you can, have, you can have endophthalmites, conjunctival er er erosion, then the left side, you can see the right side. If you have, if you have a long tunnel, you don't, don't be afraid. You, this tunnel, uh, this flange, it will be great. Then right side is not good. You can produce main complication. If, for example, in my first paper about the four eyelets IOL, that you can see uh, endophthalmite, uh, endophthalmite uh, uh, conjunctival erosion and uh, uh, inflammation that I treated with seven days with moxfloxacin and uh, corticoids. And after seven days, I back to the operating room and reduce the flange inside it again in the right side. Guys, thank you for the, the, the attention and thank you uh, all uh, speakers uh, for me, Shin and Ashvin. It's an honor, uh, this, the, the creme of the la creme of the scrub fixation the world with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. That, that is such a great uh, modification of uh, Yamini's um, uh, modification of the haptic. It's so crazy how now we've found so many ways to use proline and you're sort of the leader of the band. And, uh, and so I, we're gonna um, now move to Carlo, who's, who's got a, an artificial lens which um, borrows from some of these ideas or, or, or pushes these ideas forward. And look forward to your presentation, Carlo. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ashvin. And hello, everybody. In 2012, I had an idea. Why don't put uh, a T-shaped plug on a closed haptic? Okay. And, um, uh, why? Just to put, uh, why don't put a T-shaped plug on a closed haptic uh, of um, a foldable lens? 
in order to avoid to use suture uh, to fixate the lens to the sulcus. And since from the beginning, the lens worked uh, quite well. That's why after two years on 2014, I presented the first report of the first nine cases to the European Congress of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, which is important. There is a very good paper of Takeshi Sujura that shows how is the thickness of the sclera just in front of the ciliary sulcus. You may see that the thickness ranges between 1.5 till 2 millimeters only. And if you can see uh, my plug, my plug is uh, uh, the thickness of my plug is just uh, 0 0.3 millimeters. Then on the on the right side, you may see uh, the sclera, um, some anterior segment OCT, and you can see how is the plug buried in the sclera. There are no sign of a deformation of uh, the sclera. And no sign of uh, irritation or decubitation. Let's go ahead. A part of uh, this is a experimental video. You can see how to how the plug works. Uh, once you grab with your micro uh, retractable forcer, the the plug, the two the two wings of the plug bends like an arrow. Then go through the thickness of the sclera and opens on the other side and stabilizes the lens to the ciliary sulcus. But this lens has different other features. I, I want to show you, I mean, I want to show you uh, how big, how big is, the, is the loop. Such a big loop uh, works like a wing stays in the ciliary sulcus and stabilizes the lens. So this lens has a very good three-dimensional stability because uh, the lens cannot tilt along the axis between the two T-shaped plug. And then another thing, you may see there are some notches here um, be, uh, in the arms, they are connecting the loop and the optic uh, optic disc, and uh, this notch uh, may allow to the lens to be adapted to different diameter of ciliary sulcus without modification of the distance between the optic disc and the cornea. So the effective lens position remain fixed. So this lens has a very good refractive predictability. Let's see how it works. Just uh, opposite 180 degrees opposite um, sclera flaps, uh, four by four, uh, perforate at 1.5 on the bed of the scleral bed, of the scleral pocket. Then you uh, grab the, um, the, the plug with the forcep and you externalize the plug of the leading, the leading optic. You have to do with your micro forceps the thing thing with the trailing optic. And once the plug is externalized, open and stabilizes the lens without any suture. Special recommendation, two curve no teeth micro coaxial forceps because if you have a, a deep set eye or if you have a big nose, you, it will be very difficult for you to handle the T-shaped plug. Always try the forcep in the scleral hole before inserting the IOL. Always engage the plug before inserting the IOL uh, in the anterior chamber. Otherwise, you may drop the lens in the vitreous. Always uh, sculpt a wide scleral flap uh, to avoid late decubitation of the plug. Suture carefully the conjunctiva. This is a follow-up of uh, eight years. You may see uh, the anterior segment OCT and some photo, slit and photo. There are no deformation of the sclera, no sign of the decubitation. Two years late, I changed the technique. Now I'm doing two radial cutting opposite 180 degrees, two small scleral pockets uh, on the two sides of the two scleral cutting. Then I perforate at 1.5 millimeters from the limbus. I insert the forcep. This, the procedure now is the same. You hold the, for, uh, hold the plug 
and progressively you insert the IOL in the anterior, cha anterior uh, chamber. At the same time, you externalize the T-shaped plug with the, uh, of the leading optic. The same thing uh, we have to do with the trailing optic. Now the, the plug is on the sclera with the forcep, you have to bury it in the small pockets you have previously realized. Then you may put a, a small stitch on the, on the conjunctiva. That's it. This is a follow up at uh, one year. You may see the plug here on the, uh, on the conjunctiva. And this is the same patient. Uh, you can see how is buried the plug deep in the sclera. There is another way to use this lens. This is a, a, a luxation of complex bag IOL. What I've done, I, I put viscoelastic behind uh, the, the first lens uh, and the vitreous. I have inserted the lens behind the, the vitreous, the second lens behind the vitreous and the, the first bag and IOL. Then here, in this case, I made a mistake. I could not externalize properly the, the plug of the leading optic. So the plug of the optic is still behind the iris root. What I've done, I have started to fixate the, the plug of the trailing optic. So at least one half of the lens is stabilized to the sclera in the ciliary sulcus. Then I have removed the complex of a bag luxated IOL. And then I've tried to identify behind the iris, the plug of the leading optic. Once you can see the plug of the leading optic, the procedure is almost ended, finished. I've done three patients all, uh, always with the same procedure, luxated lens. In uh, all these three cases, I have explanted one lens. I have implanted a scleral fixation lens without any movement of the vitreous. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to Ashwin for the invitation. Hey, thank you, Carlo. That was, that was wonderful. I really appreciate you sharing uh, that innovative lens design. Uh, and your great experience with that. Well, I, I uh, just want to uh, tell you we're, we're, uh, we've done a great job getting through our cases, and now we've got a few minutes where we want to discuss. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about. There's a lot of really interesting things um, uh, to discuss. But we want to start off with our very patient panelist who's waited all this time, uh, and now we can um, hear from her, Shashiko, who's going to uh, start off with a video, uh, and then um, I'd like you to... Um, uh, uh, maybe comment on some of the cases if you could. Thank you. I will show you the video of cartridge pull-through technique. Clean the vitreous body around the IOL. A scleral coronial incision is created. Adjust the position of the IOL. OVD is filled inside the cartridge. Set the forceps to the cartridge. The forceps are inserted into the anterior chamber to grasp the IOL optic. Push the cartridge into the anterior chamber from the wound. Pull out the forceps from the cartridge. The cartridge and the forceps are pulled out of the anterior chamber together. Next case is extraction of a single piece IOM. Next case is extraction of hydrophilic IOL. The tools used this time are Hoya cartridge and the Fukuoka's IOL extraction forceps. We believe that the cartridge procedure technique is a minimally invasive IOL extraction surgery. Great video, great video. You, you need to cut the cartridge at the front or is it not necessary? Uh, I think Hoya D1 cartridge is the best. But this cut is currently difficult to obtain. So use instead of D1 cartridge, um, C1 cartridge of Hoya or 
to see Kadrit of Nibet. And monarch A of Alcon cannot use because this cartridge is too long. Tip of the forceps cannot appear from the cartridge. Do you always make slit for to to the cartridge? Um, so if you think the cartridge is thin, so you have to cut it better. One more question. Uh, how big is the uh, how, how long is the tip of your forcep? Um, the head, the head of your saw or your forcep. How how long it is? It's a shaft. The the length of the tip. Yes, of the, the length of the tip of the forcep. Yes. Uh, Four millimeters. I don't know the detail, but okay. the monante cutlery is too long and uh, okay. good. Because like you, if you have a small head, you will not able to pull it inside. Uh, yeah, but works yeah, anyway. Right. Works so the length is enough. We we need to buy your forceps, or we can use another kind of forceps. Um, so that, uh, I designed these forceps and uh, yeah. so um, forceps for overseas are currently um, being re um, prepared just now. Can, so, can we use an, another forceps like uh, forceps for D, D sake or something? Um, another choice of Yes, forceps? or the, the ICL forceps, I don't know. Uh, I tried to the vitreous uh, forceps, vitreous surgery uh, forceps, 23 yeah. days or something like that. It is yeah. uh, really fine and uh, the break the IOL and we can't use. Okay. Okay, thank you. Great technique. Thank you so much. Tom? Yeah, I, I, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, there's a lot of people that are probably um, watching that are wondering, how can I get started? Because I, I think one of the things that's um, interesting about techniques like this is, um, is the transition uh, that, that is difficult for people to do. And, and I think, um, you know, it's one thing uh, for really bold surgeons like Amar to try techniques like this. But for a lot of people, it, they need a stepwise transition. And I just wanted to show I just wanted to show this one um, this one little video uh, just to emphasize how easy it is to um, to use simulated eyes. And so this is just a a, a Craig Phillips uh, simulated eye. There's there's a bunch of different models, but it just shows that even even a relatively complex technique uh, with sclera manipulation. Um, can um, can be can be uh, simulated with uh, these eyes. This is Craig Phillips' eyes. All the basic issues of uh, Dr. Agarwal's technique can easily be simulated with this particular eye. You certainly can do the same thing with uh, Dr. Yamini's technique, with Brian Kim's modifications of that technique. He showed you some um, uh, some uh, simuli uh, eyes. So I just wanted to emphasize that um, you know for a lot of folks. Um, I think it's going to be tricky to 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 change and to try these techniques. And so, uh, one of the things we learned during COVID, when all of our ORs were shut down, uh, was that we could use our our OR, bring these simulated eyes into the OR and practice. You don't have to have a fancy wet lab. Uh, you can you can use your own OR. You can use these uh, artificial eyes, which have no cadaver or animal products, and you can try these techniques. And I think it's 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 a nice transition. You watch the videos, you try them on these simulated eyes, uh, and then I think the third step to to do transitions, if you're not um, if you're not as bold as Dr. Agarwal and, and others here, uh, is to bring somebody with you for that, those first cases. So if your very first case, bring uh, bring somebody else that's that's familiar with anterior segment. You don't. Neither one of you have to have done the case before, but if both of you have some skills and um, in other areas of anterior segment. 
it's very nice to have two people there, two four hands um, when you're when you're doing uh, these cases for the first time. So uh, I just wanted to just wanted to emphasize that. Does anybody else have any tips on on getting started? Because remember, a lot of people that are watching um, may may be nervous about getting started. So um, any any other tips anybody else has? I think Brian should go first. Brian, what do you say? Well, um, I agree 100%. Um, and, and Tom brings a great point about bringing artificial eyes uh, so you don't have the pressure of, you know, potentially harming a patient. I think a stepwise approach is exactly my story. You know, when I went, did a cornea fellowship and graduated, um, you know, you have some basic skills uh, as far as suturing and, and manipulating in the anterior segment. But, you know, a lot of these techniques I learned after the fact. So I think for me, you know, suturing iris was one thing I started to learn. And then at, at the time when iris suturing of eye walls were kind of more popular, I learned that technique. And, and then learning how to do parse plane of vitrectomy as well. And I think with each component, you, you're able to learn uh, the next step. So, you know, being able to do the railroad suturing in an aerodialysis situation for throw pupiloplasty, glued IOL, doing uh, even like learning how to do traps and doing scleral flaps, so I think help you with doing the glued IOL technique. And I think learning a variety of techniques will kind of build your overall armamentarium. And then even though techniques become new, you will have had some level of experience with those types of um, maneuvers. And I think that is very important. Even knowing how to position yourself at the head of the, of the patient, you know, more temporal, more superior, being aware of various ergonomic issues that go on, I think do help step by step. So I think you can't just jump into the deep end of the pool. You have to tiptoe and do kind of a sequential um, approach as Dr. Edding said, said as well. Okay, I'm, I'm for, for the panel. Uh, what about the material of the haptics? I use, and I recommend for the beginners, PBDF haptics. What is your experience about it? Uh, I, I, I think the PVDF haptics are are fantastic. Uh, I just feel that the availability across the world is very very low, so that's a big issue with uh, with PVDF haptics. So you have to make do with something else, and that's where all the other techniques kind of come into play. One second is also I feel that uh, uh, Yamane technique is fabulous in its own way. But there are some limitations to it, and that's where you really need to have a, something secondary in your armamentarium or in your uh, in your hand to actually go ahead and implant and lens in those cases. And that's where the other techniques also open up a whole new channel. Uh, having said that, I'd, I'd love to hear a few comments for beginner surgeons from uh, Sergio. Why not, uh, Sergio? You, you're teaching a lot of uh, young surgeons as well as young medical students, so. Uh, Go ahead, if you have any tip for younger surgeons. Uh, I think the more important is to start with wet lab uh, and uh, know everything about the technique you will try to, to, to perform. Uh, I saw some surgeons only looking the video on YouTube and want to start it. I think it's a, a great error and it can uh, produce a a damage for your patients. Then my my big suggestion is start in wet lab, start with step by step, uh, study the technique, study the tips, the peers uh, before to to go to do to the live surgery with your patient. Right, Carlo. I agree. A, a, I agree. Absolutely. You have a great IOL, but some physician says something about the material. How is it works with silicon oil? Is it okay? Carlo? Yes? You here? Yes, tell me. Some okay. physicians say something about the material of your IOL. That yes. is not good for use when we, you make a vitrectomy with silicon oil. Is that true? Yes, it's true. But I mean, now there are uh, they are starting now on the market different other materials. They are more. Uh, this lens starts to be uh, as hydrophilic. Yes. Okay. 
apart of the silicon oil, um, there are no any problem because PC opacification <laughs> does not affect this paint. No, no. yeah, <laughs> you're right. Without any anyway, without without capsule. Second, I mean, I had three cases uh, yes. with the recorded with the retinal detachment and silicon oil. Uh, there are small droplets, small droplets on the posterior surface of the lens, but the visual acuity is absolutely perfect. But anyway, now the material is starting to change in a, a hydrophobic. There are some problem of stiffness. I mean, is is a less is a more difficult to handle. Yes. But I um, mean, there's we are starting new material now. Okay. Uh, hydrophobic. Okay. Perfect. Great. But on the other hand, you have uh, many advantages. Is uh, still elastic. Even if you pull it a lot, you will not break it. With a, a three-piece lens, if you pull it. You break the lens absolutely. You break the optic absolutely. Yeah, you are right. What's the best technique for a fake assault? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tom. Wow, that's, that's the perfect question. <laughs> Go directly in the jugular. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I wanted to ask you for, for any of these any of these cases uh, that we just discussed. You can sometimes get uh, exposure of the haptic, uh, and so I've had I've had or, or possibly exposure of um, uh, the suture. Uh, so in my experience, uh, this is very rare. Uh, and what we've done uh, is we've typically uh, used um, uh, tissue glue with either sclera or tutoplast or something like that, and just put it over the top. Um, so I want to hear what other people are doing in that situation, in that rare situation where you have exposure of either the uh, proline suture or the haptic. How about how about uh, Dr. Yamini? What what is your maybe that this never happens to you, but what it, what would what is your approach? So you mean how, how to avoid uh, exposure of uh, friends? Well, I mean, if 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 it becomes exposed, what do you do? Yes, and it's very rare, but if, if the flange exposed from the square tunnel, I, I enlarge the square tunnel using needle or some knives and put, push the flange in, into the square. Do you put anything on top of that, like uh, tutoplast or, or cornea or sclera, or you just you just tuck it in? Sorry? Do you put any other material on top of that, like additional sclera or additional corneal tissue or, or tutoplast? No, no, just 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 push the flange in, into the sclera. If, yeah. if if I push the uh, if I fix the flange completely inside the sclera in the first surgery, it it never moved to outward. So so if you if you don't fix the flange and if you leave the flange on the square it it will move so you must push push the flange completely inside the square okay i i, 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 I make melting of the square yes. i make two pockets usually I, I make a little modification in the yamane's original technique but with the two pocket uh, the haptics go Every every time into the square, they go. They don't go out. Ashwin, uh, I I like to to hear about the the master Dr. Amar. Your consideration for for the the the, the young uh, surgeons. Basically, when you have an exposure of the haptic, it basically if you are doing an agluda or any technique like this, it means basically that. You have not tucked the haptic inside. You've done it partial thickness or into the conjunctival area. That's the main reason why it comes out. What you do is I take the patient back to the OR, lift the flap, make a deeper pocket tunnel inside and tuck the haptics inside. The second reason why an haptic exposure can happen is if you don't have enough haptic exposed uh, to tuck inside. So there's very little which has just come out of it. So in which case you might have to come more anteriorly. That's why I said 
look at the amount of haptic which is exposed there should be a lot of haptic which can be going inside the gabbosharius tunnel because if you don't have enough then the tilt will happen one final thing is we are just published in the jcrs it's coming out it's online now a 12 year study of the glued iols and what we are seeing in that is a 1 degree tilt less than 1 degree tilt which is after 12 years i'm talking about which shows an extreme amount of stability of these lenses interstitial haptic fixated lenses even after 12 years okay my friends we take a look a long uh, a lot of time ashwin uh, 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 a words for close the station yeah uh, so uh, thank you uh, so much everybody for you know being a part of this event it's been absolutely stunning to organize it for every all the audience and having each and every one of you getting to know you guys so much more deeper better it's always been a pleasure uh i i have to have to have to thank my internal team and sergio's team to actually help out uh, organizing this event i also must thank shin and sergio to actually help me pull off something like this because honestly speaking it's all on their shoulders i have done nothing uh but just crawl up and be on their shoulders uh you know we are closing this course all right but i wanted to also lean in uh to each of your years and also uh bring you to up to speed that april 10th and the 17th we will be having uh the world webinar on cataract and refractive and it's a two day affair uh spread over two saturdays uh, our website should be up in the next month or so but we're going to have a lot of good sessions over there as well uh would love to see you there the world webinar 2021 edition will be live and kicking but nonetheless world afakia course will also run uh as an annual event but this has been absolutely brilliant thank you so much for being here shin and sergio if you could also comment in a few words and uh you know give your goodbyes no you the chief you the boss you are ours come at the end <laughs> but <laughs> don carlo sashiko gerardo amar brian thank, thank you everybody thank Ian. you everybody thank you everybody Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Merry Christmas. Yep. Bye -bye. Happy New Year. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Again. Bye.